We are already too late for the afternoon session. Take your seat, please. Good afternoon. Well, uh, this session is a uh, show an overview for the win-win initiative of Harvard Global Health Catalyst. Uh, the win-win initiative is a notion and not an uh, organization. It is notion adopted by the Harvard Global Health Catalyst for all our activities. And when I speak today, I speak not on my behalf, but we are a team. Uh, I have no conflict of interest. As you see, all this is volunteer work. Uh, uh, and I was past president of our tech also. Uh, of Rocks, and uh, President of ISDOC, and Chair of Harvard Global Health Catalyst Win-Win Initiative. What I present here is not only on my behalf, but it is hand-in-hand -hand, uh, work, and all this team, and all who would like to join also, will, will be very happy to, 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 to welcome, and. Uh, all of us are cooperating together. We are like an orchestra. Uh, once again, the win-win con will continue and succeed only if with the contribution with many. So welcome all, and the win-win belongs to all. Uh, it was in December 2007 that I proposed this uh, initiative. It was uh, as a part of ISODOC Experts in Cancer Without Borders. It's, uh, this is uh, isodoc.org, and please uh, visit this link. You will find, click on win-win, you will find many publications, many things. It aims at an increase of affordability of better value cancer care in the world via exploring scientific approaches. All the stakeholders, particularly cancer patients and their families, could win. As it considers the interests and incentives of all stakeholders, including industry, uh, pharmaceutical company and all. Otherwise, it will, will be something like romantic story or recommendation or asking for pity. No, all could win. And this would also could lead to flourishing the business of pharmaceutical company and radiotherapy machines and medical device. The notion of win-win is growing. Hence, uh, in uh, April 2016, it become one of the, of the core of Harvard Global Health Catalyst under the direction of my brother, uh, Will Negua, who really directed in a way that give us the environment for leadership and to, to, to continue to, to progress. This assure progress, continuity, and broad partnership. The initiative is open for partnership with experts, industry, organization, all constructive idea that serves the cause. We are not competing, we are not challenging, but complementing and catalyzing. This is the example of e-cancer for all. This is the educational part. And now we have another part I will say about it uh, after minutes. The two wings of the win-win are, the first, exploration of scientific approaches to increase affordability of better value cancer care. Every word here is important. Increase affordability to, with dignity, what is the value of speaking about new treatment or anything if it is not affordable to patients? And I'm not speak about lower middle income country only or Africa, but everywhere. 
we are starting and concentrating on Africa because the, the most tragic situation is in Africa. And who will succeed in Africa? Believe me, will succeed everywhere in the world. Succeed in the United States even. And better value, because this is an important question, is not only speaking about quality. Uh, in an article of uh, some article in 2008, 2010, they say the, the end of quality movement. Long live value. Now it is value. And uh, you see some details of uh, uh, some publications that present it. And if any just uh, uh, would like to this presentation in details and other, uh, please uh, uh, send, uh, send me and send to Will. And you find this some of publications as it's clear we speak about what? Speak science and affordability of cancer drugs and radiotherapy in the world. Win-win scenario, this full chapter here. The second wing of the win-win regards catalyst action and professional, technical, medical advice to increase enormously the rate of establishment of service of clinical oncology in the world, starting from, with the most difficult challenges in Africa. We don't claim that the win-win catalyst and, volu uh, and volunteer advisor will have the credit, but the stakeholders, international and nationals, and mostly the local, the locals doer of any project are the real uh, real heroes. We don't claim any credit. We are catalyst advisor. We mean by clinical cancer care of, uh, or, or clinical oncology care all modalities of cancer treatment and diagnosis with special emphasis on confronting the challenge of severe lack of radiotherapy care. But it's not isolated. It is in the heart of all challenges. Please feel free to, to, to some of the, some, some relevant publication presentations that explain what we are saying and what we are doing and welcome you to, 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 to join. And if you see isodoc.org and then you click on win-win, you'll find many. And this example just shows that our scope, here for example, is uh, uh, care variation in availability of cancer drug generic in the United States is already in an analysis of oncology. Uh, a shortage of essential cancer drugs and generics in the United States of America. Global brainstorming directions for the world. Uh, better value chemotherapy, it is in Oxford. And in a nice book, How to Get Better Value Cancer Care with Sir Moore Gray and David Kerr. And this question, could African and low middle income countries contribute scientifically to global cancer care? I ask you to, 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 to read this article and to, 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 to start communication about. Yes, not Africa is not just to help Africa. How could African and low medical income country contribute scientifically to global cancer care? Yes, it is possible. Not only possible, but it's needed. What is this? <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry. And uh, other examples, okay, and books with uh, Will Negwa. Why win-win? Because there are many talks, strategies, plans, declarations about increase of affordability of cancer care or drugs by 2025, before it was 2020 and before it was, uh, uh, or other announcement or publication. But despite of all this, do you notice any remarkable increase in affordability of better value cancer care in the real world? Since this announced publication? No. I think no. Did the gap between the required and the available radiotherapy cancer care in low middle income country, or better to say, underserved region, increase in the last 10 years? Not me who replied, but this is an article, Journal of Global uh, uh, Oncology. This is May uh, uh, Ling and um, uh, my friends in the IEA. IEA themselves say that we are going backwards. The gap is increasing, is widened. So despite of declaration, conferences, and everything, uh, goodwill, OK, but something should be done. The gap is increasing, is wide, and will increase more because there is increased population, increased prevalence and incidence of cancer, particularly in developing countries, and with skyrocketing uh, price of drugs. And you'll see the tragedy in the United States now after two suicide the shortage of the, uh, in the world at least of more than 10,000 radiotherapy units. We are not do, doing our duty, and industry also, okay? In, in the upcoming seven, 10 years, 
due to skyrocketing rise in cost of cancer treatment and new drugs, according to ASCO. This is just in 2019. In the ASCO, I can send you the, the declaration. This is ASCO survey. I, I can't believe it. 40% of American cancer patients now abandon oncology and oncologists and oncology. Okay, they leave the oncologist. <laughs> abandon the oncologist. And search it for alternative methods, uh, plans or something. For fear of what? It is surprising. For fear of cost of treatment. And that is come before the fear of death and cancer pain. This is in the United States of America. This is an alarm. So I am not speaking about Côte d'Ivoire or about south of Egypt or something. This is the United States. This is ASCO. So what is about less affluent countries? Cancer drug dominates top 10 list selling drugs. This is Humera. This is uh, this for, for Mr. Da Wilson and for uh, Habibi, uh, uh, Mr. The, that, that you dream about maybe one billion more of sales. But Humira, the sales of Humira is 19.9. This is about 20 billions in the year 2018. And will increase. It's one drug. The second drug, uh, linolenomide, is uh, poor, 9.7. You imagine. We are not doing our, our duties. The program sell death cases to seven to only billion in one year. And contrary to belief, to belief, a recent study showed that the demand of chemotherapy will be doubled by the year 2040. Because since I was resident and young specialist in France, we hear, why you are doing oncology? Tomorrow afternoon at 6 p.m. will be, appear the magic pills and on cancer will finish. I hear this when, since I was resident. And why you, why you specialize in cancer? This was in Paris in, when I was young. <laughs> but now, it is not the magic dream that we, we will. This is published in Lancet Oncology. Where is David Colin Gridge? OK. In just May 2019, wake up and wake up call. Global demand for chemotherapy will, be, will double by 2040. OK. And this is a skyrocketing price now. Imagine what after five years and six years. No economy will, 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 fit for, will fit this. That is why we say when win-win, we move together. This is to flourish markets, to save collapse, to, uh, markets from collapse. We can't continue like this. Lem remember that the whole global sales of leading manufacturer of radiotherapy, correct me if I'm wrong, not exceeding three billions a year. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yes? Yes? Not exceeding three billions, the whole sale every year? This is, it is uh, something like what is left in the vials, maybe on chemotherapy or something. Where is the world is going? If we continue with the same approaches, challenging each other with the sale of this machine here and there, this is nothing. We need 10,000 of machines. And how we go with the lack of good surgical intervention in many parts of the world. That is why we have a, a wing for surgical oncology. Tomorrow, my friend Ricardo Desio may become afternoon, and we have starting a course of surgical oncology training uh, uh, courses and uh, online, besides uh, uh, training. But before treatment, what is about adequate pathology and diagnostic measure? And I ask my colleague uh, Lovic, uh, prospective contribution of digital pathology, increasing affordability of better value cancer around the globe. This is a question. Yes, we should, we should tackle new technology to, to facilitate things. And where is the big and essential roles of scientific approaches and big solutions? And not just showing pity or recommendation or short effect assistance. It is not fanatism, a fanatism to the term win-win. I say we say win-win-win. No, because without this, we, we are speaking about romantic thing. All should win. This is because in the real world, the interest of all stakeholders, industries, government, uh, uh, investors should be inter uh, 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 respected and considered. And how will we consider that is what we need you all to invent smart approaches. What we have now is wrong. If you continue like this, we are in disaster. We have to speak about innovative things to business model. That is why I ask it, uh, Mr. Dow Wilson. We need a business, mo many business model. And I dream about something like invest in Macedonia, invest in something, invest 
in radiotherapy in this country. You will not lose, lose your money. You will treat patient, and we are with you. Your, man, your machine, that your, what is sold, continue to function, but not to sell machine, and the, the next day, you are crying beside the machine. This is, this is, this is, this is fact happening many, 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 in many countries. We know this, and we suffer from this all. So how to say, come, invest in radiotherapy. We have the models. We'll follow you. We are with you. Harvard Global Health Catalyst. We have university now. I have everything. Advice, project from A to zero, from design, from consultation, from education. But just make the business model. It is different from one country to another. We are not speaking about romantic things. We are speaking about the real world. If you continue like this, nothing. And a big organization, I, 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 I was part of all this. And uh, international organization, but after four years, you speak about, we in this international organization, four machines here and there, one of them all uh, cobalt, and one of them uh, all the Chinese. And this is the whole U, U, UN. This is, this is nonsense. This is nothing. And meeting, going to Vienna, coming back from Vienna, going to Vienna, committee, declaration, article. But what? Four or five uh, machines? And this is the, the international action. And loud speaking about these four or five machines all times. This is nothing. We need 10,000 machines, OK? Otherwise, we become, otherwise, if we don't consider even the interest of oncology, because they, get, we, they gain from drugs, OK? It is, it, is, it, is, it is a real fact. So how we can deal with the real world, otherwise, uh, it will become part of the problem and not a key player or solution. Uh, it is attributed to Albert and Einstein that negative persons find a problem in every solution. We, in, in the win-win, together, we don't say problems or barriers. Stop to say article about barrier, obstacles. Okay, we, so what? But speak about challenges to solve, exercise to, 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 to do. And that could, could all win. But obstacle, obstacle, obstacle. Yes, if you say obstacle, say something to solve it. So what is the role of science if you just uh, repeat about? It is to be clear, we are professional consultant, volunteer catalyst, not funding body. We, our scope is international and global, everywhere, even in the East Europe, even in uh, can solve problem in the United States. But we are, our emphasis on, on Africa because it is the most tragic situation. And who succeeds in Africa will solve a problem even in Japan and everywhere. We can learn from uh, oncology. It, the win-win initiative is a notion. It is not one more competing organization, but a dynamic movement. We are movement. We are, we are, we are very flexible, and we are working just by email to uh, WhatsApp or something. We move. This is not papers and many things. It is a movement. It is a hand-to-hand -hand cooperation with respecting the entirety, independence, and the credit of all collaborating bodies and organizations. If we say join, we are not interfering with, with your entirety or independence or decision, but co cooperating partnership. We don't search for glory or credit. The real heroes are the doers, particularly the locals. The harvest is plenty. It needs a lot of doers. Our sole focused objective is to see more number of cancer patients receiving their value-based treatment with dignity in their country. This is our sole objective. If we do this, then we succeed. If we don't see this, uh, do this, if we don't see this, that's nothing. This is just speaking and uh, a conference and uh, our the win-win belongs to all and to all of you. It is estimated, as you, as you, as you know, 10,000 machines at least. The present condition and approach continue. If we continue like this, the gap will increase in the upcoming year. It not will not solve it, but five, five, six machines here and there. There is a great need to wide and effective promotion for radiotherapy clinical oncology in the world, and not in the same way. We need someone who leads this business model, someone who have business good expertise in radiotherapy and model to have something like foundation. We are with him as Harvard Globalist Catalyst Win Win and all, and. I dream, let, let me dream loudly with you, some, something in the uh, TV or something, a movie, like fly uh, British Airways or fly uh, United. Uh, invest in radiotherapy. You will not lose your money. You, it is, you will treat patients. And it is not just assistant by pity, 
but you gain and all will gain. We are with you. We provide you with all experience. And or other how it is cost effective. It's very cost effective. But we speak together in conferences about cost effective. Believe me, if you ask any responsible, even in the developed country, about it, you say, oh, this is accelerator is very expensive, is everything, you know? But you speak with each other about cost effectiveness. We don't show this to the public, to the lay people, to the street. They are the pressure. Show this, how it is very cost effective. No revelries, the harvest plenty. No need to challenge each other. I don't see any problem with industry to, to, because the, the harvest is plenty. <laughs> we speak about thousands of machines needed. And a, 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 a very big market lacking of good cancer treatment, lacking of surgery, lacking of everything. The harvest is plenty. It need a lot of doors. Again, what we need from industry, frankly, support, advice, to provide updated information, continuously to explore approaches together and to follow up and to assess progress, not just to do something, but to, to continue to follow up and to learn for what, what, what is done. We need this. Some points, here are some, just examples that it is to think that it's a dream and it's not feasible to do. It is feasible. If we don't do it, that is, we fail to do our duties. Hence, the issue is not about one center here or there, but about it is very big uh, 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 to, to, to fill the, the gap. It is, it is na not naive thinking, but presenting it in such simple and direct way and searching for your solution together is an advantage. We are not speaking about very complicated, there's, there's very clear things. It's also to me, to, a miss to think about no local resources in African countries. This is a miss. We all know this is a miss. There's a lot of money, but it needs how to mobilize and work together how to mobilize it, not just to give some drugs here and there and say this is, this is your help to uh, this African country. You find resources, but how, and this is exercise for industry and for all of us, how to present pro pro projects of profitable service of radiotherapy that would be feasible to mobilize lo uh, local resources to fund. Well-studied project. Good business models. This is why we mean need a will in the, um, some people from Harvard Business School. Yes, and from business, and sales from industries. They have, we need their experience. We are doctors and physicians, but we need this. This is business. Good business model customized to the local conditions that could function and gain in community, could get loans from banks, local stakeholders, and this are the support. The support have a lot of money. This is Will who gives this uh, number. A 67 point billion, more than the total foreign aid. This is coming from the support. You imagine this. You solve all your, your problem, not of cancer, everything. The annual two billions of money from Africa to India spent on to cancer treatment. This is two thirds of the sales of a variant, maybe, I think, or maybe more than Electa. Okay. The bill of cancer treatment of African patients, like Senegal in France, is enough to establish ad adequate modern local cancer service every, in every corner in Senegal. Senegal. Okay. Value depends on, on results, not input. Uh, input. So uh, it is, it is, um, now we are in the third and fourth revolution. We are not just a big center of excellence. I hear today, today, center of excellence. This is, I don't know who invents this, center of excellence. What is important is what you did for your patients. So shift in focus, and this is the third revolution at first, and now we are in the fourth revolution, we should go forward. Shifting focus from volume to value is a central challenge in the third revolution of health. This 2008 is old already, how to get better value cancer care of us also. The notion of third and third or fourth revolutions in science and health become evident. No excuse to enter, no, to not to enter in force uh, revolution for Africa or for South Asia because it is, uh, it is a problem for all. Why you start with a horse while a car is present? Why you start with uh, 2D cobalt while you have technology? I don't know what, uh, what, is, what is the logic in this. The fourth industrial revolution will transform the health care of rich and poor countries alike. It is new for all, even for United States, even for Europe. It is new for all. So start together the, the new thing. It is not nonsense to think about primitive technology. Again, the poor, uh, the poor uh, primitive machine, this is a solution. I hear this since I was a resident, since many years, many decades. <laughs> but this is wrong. 
Don't, speak, don't think about primitive technology or device. It is waste of resources, but we can use science smartly to develop more feasible, applicable, simpler, operate more prompt maintenance, more cost-effective, more efficient, more value outcome related to cost and not necessarily the price of a machine or a drug per se, but better value indication and mode of administration. And you have in second part here two examples of devices, use technology, but make the, 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 the accelerator less expensive with new technology, with IMRT and the other one, IGRT. How smartly by science, and this is science. We are, by science, we resolve barriers like electricity power supply. Don't speak about barriers, no, uh, problem of electricity. Search about solution, some power, saving electricity like some, some machine of uh, barrier or other. How to mobilize the resources toward economically sustainable cancer care or project. Otherwise, we are not doing our duty. Uh, it's launched in the last uh, meeting. Uh, it is uh, e-cancer for all, the win-win ambassadors, and the core of young ambassador of Harvard, Global Health Catalyst, because young ambassadors is the future. This is the present and the future. This is very important. And ambassador, uh, among you, many of our ambassadors. Uh, e-cancer uh, for all, a comprehensive tele-oncology platform uh, to access to safe and clean oncology registry service. The win-win ambassadors, as you see, the e-cancer for all, and this is premier a comprehensive cancer center in the cloud, T4. This is due to the effort of Nigua. Uh, to increase, dramatically increase access to cancer care. And we are all with him. Be with him, please. Until every cancer patient has access to Qualitrim, he's doing what? Care, tele-oncology, e-consultation, second opinion, e-contouring, treatment planning. Plus win-win advice to establish more clinical oncology service. Education, online uh, 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 services. Research, multi-center, and which you, you hear today, Afrox, uh, Afrox H, Africa, Oxford, Harvard, clinical trial network, including uh, something like new uh, drone technology combining with radiotherapy. And the total cost is by using this new technology would be uh, uh, less expensive than many other, uh, other modality. And I hope that we st uh, will start this. Uh, outreach the support of industry and government and IBM partnership with artificial intelligence in chemotherapy assist doctor. Example of feature of uh, e-cancer for all, Congratu congratulations to Harvard Global Health Catalyst, uh, our winning training for over 140 African oncology health professional registers. This is just the beginning. And we have this course started in last September in clinical oncology, uh, radiation oncology, radiation physics, clinical research. This is the leader of clinical research, Professor David K. Oxford, and he's leader in a Global Health Catalyst win-win. Under uh, preparation now, surgical oncology by my friend, uh, um, our pillar, one of the pillars of win-win of initiative, Ricardo Odisio, past the president of the European Society of Surgical Oncology, and one of the leaders of win-win. It is on, on site training and operation also. Next phase, we are hoping to do a clinical pathology. Now, this is what englobe all this. This is, thank you. Well, welcome to Global Oncology University. He, he don't like to put his photo, but I, this is a surprise to you. I put your photo. <laughs> he like to be also to hide, hiding. He's working enormously developing Go U, it is a Global uh, uh, Oncology University. What is this? Sorry, what is this? What happened? Uh, it is onward winning collaborative educational model with online lectures. What is, uh, it is, is a premier university that offer both continuous medical education and degrees. Radiation oncology, medical oncology, and to, then to eliminate global cancer health disparities. It would include courses, training in surgical oncology, clinical trial, medical physics, imaging, clinical pathology, and global oncology. But what is particular also here? Every all efforts, I wrote it just yesterday, but it is from our discussion together. It, is, it would be done to prepare candidates for global uh, go you for the practice of the near future. And not only the present, it is not just give information, not only just give knowledge, but to search for scientific, to prepare this candidate, to search themselves for scientific solution or, or for cancer patients in their community. And problem of physics, machines, radiotherapy, pharmacokinetic study, pharmacogenomic study, everything. 
Hence, they will contribute more in publication and progress of science. We have tomorrow a session about publications. And you will ask all, from where you encourage these researches, scientific researches, about how to, 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 to get better value? This is one of the resources. We, we'll, pre we'll prepare them with you to be, don't give them fish, but let them be fishermen. <laughs> and then they, they do researches that contribute scientifically. And the GoU is ready now, and it is growing with all of you. In our win season of the, uh, of, of the Harvard Global Catalyst, we are not going to repeat long introduction in all the, the, the communications that will come, or that about the tragic situation. We all know the tragic situation is known by all. It's important that we go out with positive, positive points, practical support, and real partnership with the win-win. Uh, in, today, in part one, we have a keynote speech uh, uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Dow Wilson. He really, we proud that he is patron our work and ex example of scientific approaches and collaboration where is pre uh, is, will be presented. And part two, example of current potential cases in real world. And to, to say that uh, Mr. Dow Wilson patron our work, but we yesterday was speaking about Mr. Habibi to be ambassadors for the win-win. The harvest is plenty. <laughs> There's no, no need to a challenge. Example of current and potential in the real world, thank you, uh, sorry, thanks to all distinguished contributors. We are focused. We are not speaking about all aspects of cancer control. This is not wrong to speak about any, all aspects of cancer, but we, this is our focus. How to increase affordability of better value, clinical value, uh, uh, cancer care in the world. Uh, millions of cancer patients and their families in the world are need to actual, not speaking, actual, touchable, accessible, affordable cancer service, and not just talks, application, declaration, or conferences. And this is what was the message of President Dina. This is as every year my grandson, Yusuf, he sent, he sent this message to you. Uh, dear all, on behalf of all the kids of my generation, please be together for the pros prosperity of all the kids kids and, fam and their families in the world. Do your best to keep us away from suffering. All would win. Sincerely, your kid, Yusuf. He looked for this, by the way. He awaited this, <laughs> despite of all challenges. It could be a turning point in the history with you all. And as every summit, I ask you all to reply Loudly, in this planet, in our planet, are we all cousins? Please reply all loudly together. Are we all cousins? Yes. yes. Again, more loudly. Yes. yes. Then, going forward, hearts with hearts, brain with brain, and hand with hand. Thank you all. Now I have uh, the, uh, the pleasure to present Mr. Dow Wilson. He is a CEO and, as you know, and president of Varia. But not just this. He's a, a very distinguished international expert. And we, we, we hope that he can give us a big push to realize this. Not big push personally or for the Arab, but to, give a, to make a real push in the region of Millions of cancer patients are waiting for you. <laughs> okay. Welcome, Mr. Dow. Thank you, Ahmed. We can add to his enthusiasm uh, generosity. Uh, so if I can uh, keep you awake like Ahmed did, I'll, I'll count that as an accomplishment. Uh, 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 to uh, the organizers, organizers of the Global Health Catalyst meeting, uh, uh, to our host, Dana Farber, Brigham uh, and Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School, and to all of you uh, honorable guests, as we say in Africa, all protocol observed. 
uh, thank you for the invitation to talk to you a little bit about our perspective of increasing value-based radiotherapy in lower and middle-income uh, countries. You know, clearly, uh, uh, as Ahmed uh, outlined, this is a multi-year journey. Uh, it's going to take all of us uh, uh, to provide better access to care. But there is some inspiring evidence that we're making a, a, a big contribution, and we're uh, you know slowly starting to see uh, better care models uh, be generated in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, and in many other uh, emerging markets throughout the world. And we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about some of those uh, today. So I'm just going to uh, try not to make this too much of any marketing message for Varian, but introduce you a little bit to our uh, solutions, talk about cancer in Africa, some procurement considerations that I think people should be thinking about as they think about radiation therapy, um, I think that are very important for, uh, for governments to consider, um, some technology solutions for Africa, and then celebrate some successes in, uh, in Africa. Um, I don't think there's one business model that's going to work. It's a combination of a variety of models, and uh, I'll uh, show you some examples of three or four very different business models and how they worked in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, and then uh, uh, conclude in talking about uh, sustainability, especially from an education and training point of view and some of the things that we're trying to do, uh, trying to do there. Uh, our uh, company vision is one that we uh, like waking up to every morning. Um, you know, there's uh, one of the unique things we have in the healthcare world is being purpose-led, uh, and uh, we, you know, we join you as as caregivers, as governments, as uh, NGOs, as companies in the space, uh, as uh, you know, being inspired by a vision uh, that is fun to get up to. A world without the fear of cancer in our family that means a lot to us. My wife is a stage three B breast cancer survivor. Uh, and uh, you know, wouldn't be here without uh, the tools and training of people in our in our field. Our mission is to combine the ingenuity of people, uh, our own people, our customer partners, scientists, with the uh, power of data and technology to achieve new victories uh, against uh, against cancer. I won't uh, talk too much about our company, other than to say, you know, we have an installed base now of about 8,000 machines, and that. Uh, uh, for a number of years was just kind of a replacement uh, uh, cycle, you know, so we'd kind of stay at 8,000 machines, we'd ship a bunch of new ones every year, but they were just uh, mostly uh, replacing existing machines. We are seeing pretty dramatic growth in the install base. This year alone, we think the net install base of our own machines will grow by about 400 machines. Um, so uh, to grow the install base about 5% a year globally is actually a pretty big deal, and most of that growth is in, uh, is in emerging markets. Uh, and then in the bottom right, uh, well over half of our business is outside of the U.S., uh, and uh, you know, we, we see that, uh, that trend continuing and believe that over the next 10 years that 70% of our business will be, uh, will be outside of the United States. I don't want to bore you too much with our vision other than to say uh, you know, the big pivot we're trying to make is to transition from a company that was very uh, accelerator-based. Uh, you know, on the, on the left, you can see, uh, you know, we have always, for the last 70 years, we've envisioned the accelerator as, the, uh, as kind of the center of our strategy. Uh, how we could accessorize and put something new on that accelerator tended to be our strategy during most of those 70 years, and now as we pivot to the future, our, uh, our game is very much characterized by putting the patient and the healthcare provider in the center of our strategy and then thinking about what are the uh, products and services. And especially from an information technology point of view, what are the things that we can bring along with artificial intelligence to deliver on a vision where uh, any patient in the world can get the best possible care. Um, so just uh, other than just providing access to GARE, care, can we provide access where that care uh, in a village in India or Africa or wherever is the same kind of care that a patient might get here in downtown Boston. As we, uh, as we do that, our, uh, our vision is to uh, touch many more patients than we touch today. Uh, this year, as this slide's a little bit old, this year we'll treat about three and a half million patients uh, with, uh, uh, with our technology and services. Uh, by 2027, uh, we'd like to be treating 20 million patients. There are about 100 million cancer patients 
uh, from diagnosis through treatment uh, and then survivorship. I mean, one of the inspiring things that we've seen across the world today is the number of survivors in the last decade has, uh, has more than quadrupled and is about 25 million patients today uh, that, uh, that are survivors of cancer care. And they're looking for ways to interact with caregivers and, and companies uh, as, they, uh, as they manage their, uh, their post-treatment uh, uh, survivorship. So with that, uh, transitioning to Africa, this is actually a global slide that shows that cancer is now the second largest cause of death worldwide. Uh, cardiac and uh, uh, heart and circulatory disorders continue to be number one. But in many countries in the world, and in 22 states in the U.S., cancer is now number one. As you know, there are many uh, countries in, in Western Africa, for example, where uh, cancer is the leading cause of death among women. Um, and uh, in the U.S. here, uh, cancer is actually projected uh, with some of the progress uh, in cancer and the further aging of our uh, demographics uh, to be the le leading cause of death in the U.S. Here's one of the interesting things. I'm not sure the total basis of it, but uh, it'll give you uh, the hope that some people have. This is a, a forecast by the World Health Organization done in 2012 that projected in 2030 that there'd be 4 million uh, cancer patients uh, in, uh, in 2030. This was recently updated. Uh, and in 2030, you can see they expect fewer uh, cancer patients. Don't, don't know about the accuracy of this, but uh, uh, you know, their, uh, their argument is, is with, uh, uh, with, with better prevention and better education uh, that the cancer population will actually go down. Don't know that we fully, uh, fully buy it, but all the same, by 2045, they're projecting 5 million, uh, 5.2 million cancer patients in, uh, uh, in lower and middle income countries. The, uh, the interesting thing, however, that's true in both forecasts is to notice the significant mix uh, change between infectious disease and non-infectious disease. And you know, where in 2016, infectious disease was still more than half of the uh, mortality burden, uh, in uh, 2045, cancer is projected to be you know, two-thirds to three-quarters of the uh, mortality burden. And from a policy point of view, as ministers of health and uh, countries are wrestling with, uh, with this shift, obviously it means a big change in where their investment goes. And uh, we're seeing uh, good support of that across, uh, across Africa and in many other emerging uh, markets, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Of course, this gap has been well known and studied, and you've seen these results. Uh, this was a study, by the, uh, a study published in the Lancet uh, Oncology, uh, uh, co-authored by uh, authors here, uh, Princess Margaret, and many other collaborators across the world. Um, but you can see the installed base of radiation oncology centers and linear accelerators in 2015, and the projection uh, of what was needed uh, if you just extrapolated out kind of current usage rates to 2035. And you can see the very significant gap, uh, an estimate of, of 21,800 uh, linear accelerators. By 2035, they were forecasting that what that meant was replacing the 13,000. So there would be an incremental 8,000 new uh, accelerators required uh, in the world. But maybe even more significant than the capital resources required is the uh, very significant uptick in radiation oncologists, physicists, and technologists. And uh, you know, sometimes this burden is not talked about enough. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about uh, you know, the struggle to, to, to acquire equipment and build services, um, but there's a number of cases, in fact, where equipment has gone in and it is not functioning. Um, because people don't have the, the training that they need to use to use that equipment. You know, we think that it's going to be very important as we move to the future to bring knowledge to that problem. And uh, uh, we think that artificial intelligence, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, uh, can help us close the gap because um, that's the gap that would have been required just kind of projecting historical uh, uh, human resource load into the future, but we think we can bend that curve very, very significantly with uh, data science, uh, machine learning, and, uh, and artificial intelligence. 
You probably talked about this a lot already in the meeting so far, a million new cancer cases in Africa in 2016, uh, breast, cervical, prostate, liver, and colorectal tend to be the big burden. Um, you know, depending on the country, you know, what we're seeing in Africa is a, is a disease burden that actually is very well oriented to, uh, uh, to radiation therapy. 55 to 80% of cancer patients, depending on the country, uh, need, uh, need radiation as part of their treatment. Today, there are 300 linear accelerators in Africa, uh, and only about 10% of patients have access to radiation therapy in low income countries. Just to give you a benchmark to that, um, in, uh, uh, in China, it's about uh, you know, 25 to 28% uh, of patients have access to radiation therapy. In India, it's a little bit higher than 10, but not much higher than 10%. Um, so, uh, you know, clearly access to radiation therapy is a, is a, uh, a big need, and in Africa alone, estimates are that a, a thousand plus linear accelerators would be required to fulfill uh, the known uh, disease. So with that shifting gears a little bit and talking about <clears throat> procurement considerations, you know, what you see here on the left uh, is a radiation treatment vault. And you know, some, of these have, some of us have these in our own institutions. It's turned into inventory or medical record storage. Um, you know, so this is a case where lack of funding for many years, you know, the good news is the vault got built uh, as part of a, uh, of a visionary uh, future for, uh, for uh, MTRH in Kenya. Uh, the machine would eventually come. Um, in Sierra Leone, there was a secondhand CT that was purchased. We see a lot of secondhand equipment uh, going down these markets, and the machine, of course, uh, never, never worked. Um, uh, there's a, a, a cobalt machine with regular breakages. There's news this morning of a patient death in Russia from a cobalt machine uh, breaking and falling on and crushing a patient. Um, you know, these are, these are the kinds of things. It wasn't, you know, we don't make cobalt. Uh, it wasn't a Varian machine, but that doesn't uh, excuse any of us, and it sets all of us back a little bit when these kinds of things, uh, things happen. Um, uh, in uh, Kenyatta University Hospital, you know, I bought a beautiful new piece of equipment. Glad to say that now the human resources are coming together. But it r literally took uh, 12 to 18 months to kind of get the human resources together uh, to, run, uh, to run a modern uh, piece of equipment. You know, so while the Lancet report identified a bunch of challenges, limited resources, infrastructure, lack of awareness and prevention, uh, high incident, uh, incidence in patient numbers. Um, you know, at the same time on the procurement side, uh, things tend to go into a price-based tender. Tender requirements are often very outdated and very spec-oriented. Um, get guidance from traditional entities, but the tender committees lack uh, technical and clinical expertise that's needed uh, as, part of, uh, as part of the tender. Um, you know, I, I'm sure my competitors would say the same thing, um, but new technology can address many of the common uh, low and middle income country challenges. Um, there is, uh, uh, you know, a paradox where, uh, you know, a, a, ben a benefit would, would be generated from a value-based uh, procurement approach, um, but sad to say most are still reliant on uh, traditional uh, procurement and evaluation uh, methods. And, you know, I think it'd be a reasonable goal to change the conversation from technical components to what is it that you want to accomplish and make sure that that gets uh, into your tender um, and so that we can educate providers about value, as Ahmed said, and how to create value-based uh, tenders and make the ca case for evidence. I think one of the exciting things about radiation therapy, especially as it relates to advocacy with governments, is our cost per patient is one of the lowest uh, cost per patients of any therapy in cancer. Now, as we know, it's not a radiation versus surgery versus chemotherapy conversation in so many of the diseases we all work together. Um, but uh, uh, too often in the, uh, uh, in the health minister office, it's a conversation around what's the drug cost. And I think we need to do a better job of making that uh, uh, advocacy argument. Uh, you know, there's evidence 
that especially in short fractionation scheme, the cost per patient uh, in some of these countries where they're doing uh, 60 to 100 patients a day, the cost per patient is actually a, a delivering radiation therapy is measured in hundreds, not even thousands, in hundreds of dollars per patient. And that's one of the huge advantages we have compared to the thousands of dollars it's going to cost for either uh, chemotherapy or surgery. Uh, but sometimes because of that upfront equipment cost, people are afraid of that number and uh, don't realize that actual investment is units times patient, you know, units times price, and so uh, they could end up spending a lot more money on, uh, on other approaches, where especially given the disease burden, radiation therapy could be such an appropriate technology in these, uh, in these countries. There's been a few recent papers published on this. Um, we'll, uh, we'll provide those to the uh, organizers, but I think we can all do a better job in advocating for radiation therapy with governments and its cost effectiveness at a per patient, uh, per patient level. So we have uh, uh, introduced a new product, not gonna do the marketing here, but uh, you know, suffice it to say that what we've really focused on is you know, can we deliver the best image guided IMRT, uh, be very, very safe at a patient level and do it in very high volumes to help bring that cost uh, down, improve the patient experience so it's very easy on the patient, uh, make it very, very easy to use. Um, uh, you know, we, we, one of our first customers on this product was treating 100 patients a day within three weeks uh, using image guidance, uh, IMRT, in each of those patients, you know, a combination of very good education and a high level of automation on the, uh, on the equipment, um, and, uh, you know, and, and delivering as well uh, on promises of, it's a product that will go in any cobalt room, requires very little shielding, uh, and it requires about half the electricity of, uh, of, of historical uh, Linux. And you know, these are some of the things that we've got to do for emerging markets to make it easier for folks to, uh, to get in. You know, Ahmed said, you know, what's the challenge? <clears throat> and in the last 12 months uh, in Africa, we've had 33 linear accelerators ordered I'm sure our competitor's volume is about the same. Um, that, according to IAEA statistics, is a 10% increase in Africa alone. Um, that's, you know, in terms of installed base growth, that's not, that's not year over year growth, that's contribution to the installed base. That's probably the most significant change in any installed base we've seen uh, in several decades at a, you know, at a country uh, geography continent level. You know, here's uh, six examples, uh, uh, Morocco, South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Kenya, uh, of uh, some new customers that have come, in, come into place. That Halcyon product, we've had uh, 22 orders. You know, and what's inspiring is to see countries come into radiation therapy that haven't had radiation therapy. Um, you know, we've had the first radiation therapy in the Ivory Coast, the first non-cobalt in Tanzania and Senegal. Based on what's happened uh, it, with very early positive returns in Senegal, I'll show you a picture in a second, in Sierra Leone, we had, uh, uh, we had a radiation therapy system go in because of what they saw in this early experiment in Senegal. So it is happening. Um, we've had the first reliable radiation therapy after years of breakdown in Sudan, Nigeria, and the uh, uh, Republic of Congo. Um, so, uh, uh, and maybe one other to mention is a very inspiring to see what's happened in Ethiopia over the last two years in bringing a whole kind of country uh, capability up with six cancer centers, each including radiation and other uh, uh, required cancer services in a very responsible uh, and very clinically and financially responsible uh, uh, way. So, uh, you know, just to celebrate some of these successes as an example, you know, in the case of Nigeria, um, this is a place that uh, uh, historically is very much like Ahmed said. Ahmed said, Ahmed said there's a ton of medical tourism outside of Nigeria. Uh, there's 115,000 new cancer patients in Nigeria annually. Um, uh, most of them go to India uh, or Europe. Um, uh, prior to this cancer center opening, there, was only, there were only six machines in Nigeria. Many were non-functional and only providing palliative care. Uh, the cancer center was set up after a public-private partnership. Um, the NSIA constructs and operates the center 
on the uh, LUTH facility grounds using some of their own staff plus an external operator. Uh, the uh, tender included extensive training and education. Um, uh, it was a cobalt to uh, linear accelerator transition, so they knew something about radiation therapy, and it was just commissioned this year, uh, a few months ago, by President Bahari, and is off to a very good start treating uh, lots of patients where uh, patients were either having to leave the country or not get care uh, at all. In Uganda, we had a very good uh, uh, kind of first-in-country uh, partnership with the African Development Bank. Uh, where they financed uh, construction and equipment for the Uganda Cancer Institute. Uh, this, again, was a cobalt to linear accelerator uh, uh, transition. Uh, one of the very important aspects of this, uh, 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 of this partnership was a uh, grant by the U.S. AID, uh, U.S. Trade and Development Agency, provided a grant for training and education that included three weeks of classroom training in the Groat Schur Hospital in so uh, South Africa, uh, one month of on-site training at UC San Diego, and 10 weeks of remote uh, mentoring uh, in-country, and uh, a lot of training around transition from 2D to 3D and IMRT uh, uh, techniques. Um, so you can see here in the picture is the president of Uganda uh, along with the Minister of Health, shaking hands with the director of the USAID. Uh, in Kenya, uh, we had a, a, a comprehensive, this is a case where the country decided that they really wanted to encourage the private sector to take up the burden of, uh, uh, of cancer care. So uh, to do that, they put in place a reimbursement system and the Kenyan government provided coverage for radiation therapy uh, into the private sector to increase patient access to care and development. We had uh, a first-in-country halcyon at Nairobi West Hospital and the Medhill Group, you know, based on uh, the reimbursement coverage provided by the government, uh, has, uh, 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 the Medhill Group has, has signed an agreement for uh, five linear accelerators, two of which are very close to being uh, turned on. Again, an example in this case of government uh, providing the ecosystem, so to uh, speak, for for the industry to grow. And then, as I mentioned before, in Sierra Leone, based on what they saw from their neighbors in Senegal, uh, we were very encouraged and signed a, an MOU to establish the first radiation therapy center in uh, in country. Um, uh, financing was provided for a Greenfield, uh, Greenfield Center and an enduring gap in Sierra Leone is now uh, is now filled, and that's. Uh, that's, that's very, uh, very exciting. And then just to conclude on uh, uh, two little notes here at the end, one of the things we're very excited about, we announced on Wednesday of this week <clears throat> that we've acquired, uh, <clears throat> acquired the assets of uh, CTSI. CTSI is a spin out of uh, UPMC. They own uh, some dosimetry and, and treatment planning services here in the US. Uh, but uh, they have a, uh, a footprint of 11 cancer centers in India uh, where they provide standardized evidence-based after the UMP, uh, UPMC care pathway, uh, evidence-based clinical and operational expertise to underserved markets. We're not particularly uh, uh, going to go after a big expanded care footprint in India. What we are very interested in is can we now begin to develop because of the insights uh, and data that we'll gather from these sites technology-enabled services to help uh, emerging market customers get into the field faster. Uh, again, kind of coming back to that, uh, um, uh, that notion that there's this huge gap of professional services uh, that are needed for the physics, physician, and therapist, and can we uh, provide some of those services in these, uh, in these markets and help people get into the, uh, into the business uh, faster? So we're very, uh, very excited uh, about that and about the data that comes with it and using that, the data not just in radiation therapy but across the cancer enterprise to help inform how we can treat uh, cancers better uh, and more efficiently and, uh, and also uh, uh, help us through this uh, skills gap. And then last of all, just wanted to announce that we do have a uh, Cancer Care Foundation. Um, uh, we've had a, a program we call Access to Care, uh, which is really on the educational side of our business. 
um, branded it as access to care, and you know it's really been a, a services capability that we've had. Um, but we're happy to announce here that we have uh, launched a, uh, a new cancer care foundation. And many variant employees, many other companies, our company, are participants in that uh, in that foundation to help bring, especially, uh, educational training and capability to uh, uh, to uh, markets where. Uh, uh, where that is uh, especially a difficult, uh, a difficult issue. And with that, I uh, thank you for your attention and uh, turn it back to uh, 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 the program. Thank you. Jim Salaro, yes. I have the pleasure to present, to introduce uh, Dr. James Alaro, who is Program Director of National Cancer Institute for Global Health. Welcome, Dr. James. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting us uh, to this event uh, today. Uh, it's really a great event to bring people of different backgrounds to talk about one issue, and that is the issue around cancer in low and middle income countries. And also to Will, thank you for giving me the arduous task of keeping people awake at 3 p.m. In the, in the evening, so I hope I manage that as well. So I, uh, I uh, come from NCI, and I, I guess if one message for us to live here with today is that NCI is a partner in combating the burden of cancer worldwide. I'll give you a little bit of, of an overview of the Center for Global Health. I'll mention a few uh, priorities that we have and opportunities therein, and also um, emphasize the idea around uh, global research training with a few key lessons that we've learned. So the national, U.S. National Cancer Institute is the nation's leading federal agency for cancer research and training. We have several divisions and offices at NCI and we had located uh, in Maryland in Bethesda where our main campus um, is. So our primary job is to conduct research. We support and conduct research. A very small portion of that research is done within the NCI campus, but majority of the research is actually funding outside, funding NCI-designated dis cancer centers, funding researchers in U.S. institutions, and institutions abroad to conduct our science. We believe very strongly that to do good research, you have to train the next generation. So a lot of investment really goes into that. So over 90% of our budget goes outside NCI. <clears throat> our scope of work is broad, all the way from basic science going through to survivorship and um, I guess most of this can be found online. And the Center for Global Health, our mission was to advance, we were established in 2010 or 2011, to advance NCI's mission to reduce burden of cancer globally. We do part of our work by supporting and facilitating um, global cancer research in the US and abroad. We do that by building partnerships um, or collaborations, as we call them, for global cancer research, and then support training for the future generation that can do that work. If somebody is looking for a job, we are looking for a, a director for the center, and the announcement is out there. I think um, it's probably due sometimes towards um, early June, I think it is. So. All these brains here, we invite you to apply. I hope you become my boss. P 
people before me have made a case why we do um, global cancer uh, research. I will not delve too much into this, but the idea that doing cancer outside of the US really will bring different types of knowledge for the new cancers that we don't have here, and also the existing cancers, some of which present completely differently. I had a colleague yesterday, we were talking about colorectal cancer. He trained in the US, and the kind of cancers that he saw here in the US, he goes back to Nigeria, and what he sees out there is completely different from what he was taught in class. So he had to adapt his thought and bring this to the literature. There was somebody from Lancet of Oncology here today. There's really some interesting stuff happening on the ground that we hope can be brought into the fore to really inform the, uh, to inform cancer and to inform the breakthroughs that we, we have. Our general aim here is to improve health for all. We recognize the, the, the need for effective collaboration. We recognize that it is key to achieving this goal. Cancer will be solved because of the science. And if the science is good, whatever that science is, it doesn't matter. It will help everybody else. I'll, I put this up to just give you an example of our footprint. So NCI supports a lot of work. Center for Global Health supports a lot of work. I, I'll give you an example of Africa, but beyond Africa in other low and middle income countries. Currently, you can see we have over 129 awards, nine of which are awarded directly to institutions in Africa. You can see the blueprint there which countries we are in. So we, we, we are out there, we are doing great work, and most of this work is done through collaboration. Again, we, 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 this figure here is meant to just show you the breadth of our work. It goes all the way from the basic biology to cancer control. We deal with several cancers in this region, cervical cancer, breast cancer, amongst others. So it's really, really broad work, again, done in collaboration. So uh, for this, we, like I said, there's a lot of work that we do, but I'll mention a few examples that demonstrate some areas where I think are our priorities and where I also think uh, therein lies opportunities for us to exploit. So affordable uh, cancer technologies, we know that uh, prevention, early detection, and prompt treatment will be key to success in controlling cancer. We know that there are many technologies out there that are currently in use for the cancers that we know how to deal with, but most of these technologies were really not made uh, for use in low resource settings. Again, the good news here is that there's really rapid development in this technology area that I think would eventually if harnessed well, contribute to the control of cancer broadly. I'll give you an example here of work that is being done in Brazil, for example, where we have a high-resolution microendoscope that is attached to um, a, a, a computer form that analyzes that data in real time. They've been able to put all this in a van so that this van goes from community to community, dealing with cancer in real time. So somebody comes in, you are treated in the same visit, they see what is happening with you for cervical cancer, you are referred for treatment, and that is happening. We have several other tools, for example, we have an example of cryopen or cryopop that are being used to address cervical cancer to just mention a few things that we are supporting. The idea here is you get this thing that is very portable, is very easy to use, so you can train. You don't need an oncologist really to be in the field to use it. You can train several people to be able to do that, and it gives you results in these settings as they are. What makes this kind of, 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 of programs work is the idea that once you define a good scope, so first of all, the cancer there are things to do about it. We know the things that we can do about it. Those cancers are preventable or treatable. 
you've considered the local settings under which you're working, and you're looking at the existing or emerging technologies around and adopting those to be appropriate for the areas under which you work. So considering the economies of these areas, the cultures of these areas, I think uh, is, is very important. But it's about people. If you create the right teams, bringing people together, we don't have to work in silos. In this case, we have engineers working together with oncologists, working together with the business partners to really come with those technologies. Making a case for everybody why getting involved is important attracts them towards this kind of programs. <clears throat> the other example I wanted to give here uh, bilateral co-funded research uh, programs where the NCI goes into partnership with other nations or other institutions in other nations. I'll give example here, for example, US and China, where NCI partnered with China, or US and South Africa, where NCI partnered with South Africa towards doing cancer um, research. Again, the key here was the area of mutual interest. Once everybody agrees what is important, then you can find a way of working together towards solving that problem, making a case, each person making a case for their own um, needs or for their own involvement in the engagement in that project. What is key here, and I think this goes to previous speakers, was that, for example, in the case of US South Africa, South Africa actually brought money onto the table. And that money goes into funding the partner that is coming from the South Africa side. NCI brings money onto the table and their money goes into funding the US uh, PI. So these two people with their own so sets of funding come together to work towards a common goal and it has really worked well. Secondary uh, to goals for this program is for example to help strengthen the, 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 the research um, uh, grantsmanship in these uh, institutions where NCI has really played a big role in helping South Africa bring up their own research and develop, strengthen their own research cultures locally. So one of the big areas, and I think probably a case easier made, is around cancer health disparities. So this is where it is true that global is really local. So for example, here in the US, you get immigrant populations, you get minorities, you get underserved populations. That uh, is true that the, 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 the outcomes for cancers are different for those populations here. Nearly everybody in the US has come from somewhere. And you would think that should we have an opportunity of supporting this large comparative studies that are looking at different aspects that are informing or are telling us what are really leading into this um, uh, health disparity issues that we are seeing, perhaps we can get the answers to these questions. Is it an issue of genetics? Is it issues beyond just access or failure to access care? What is it about those cultures that inform? For example, if you know that you have an immigrant population of, say, Kenyans in Boston, and they have this high incidence of cancer, perhaps going back to Kenya to look at what informs that cancer in Kenya will help you address now the population that you have here in the US. I think those would be really key and it's easier for us from an institutional point of view to justify it to the people who give us the money who is a US taxpayer why it is important to do research outside of the US. <clears throat> Another important aspect that I think an opportunity is around implementation science. And again, this is a new field of, of, of research. Uh, some people are aware of it, some people are not aware. But this is where we are asking for people to really look deeply into the economic uh, aspects of the research that we do, cost effectiveness, um, you know, look at system dynamics, simulation modeling, and all that. We are asking questions about how. The idea that something is good, that you have a treatment for something, doesn't necessarily mean that it will be adopted or it will be implemented in the right way to actually give you the results that, um, uh, that you, you, you seek. 
Where I see a big opportunity here, especially for, for those who are doing research, is these governments, uh, the African governments, they are, for example, are implementing things. You can look at cancer screening, for example, cervical cancer screening. They are doing it. There are these guidelines that come, come out that they are really putting into force. And some of, some of the times, these are not informed by the existing evidence, or that evidence is really not translated to suit the environment into which they are adapting it. So you can see where a partnership where scientists come and work with these governments together as they are implementing these programs, do implementation research along the way to be able to inform their work is useful. I think there's a saying about people doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. What are those people called? If somebody knows? Oh, I didn't say it. So, But I guess there's an opportunity here where, again, scientists can really play a big role in informing how we use what we already know that we can use to help us around cancer. One of the big focus uh, around the Center for Global Health is training the workforce to be able to do this work. And most of the times when you talk about training, is usually about training people from the low and middle income countries. But I think there's even a bigger aspect about training people or training scientists who are in the US to be able to actually do global cancer research. So we divide our work into those two. We actually try to empower institutions here in the US to be able to conduct global research. And at the same time, train people in the low and middle income countries, empower institutions in the low and middle income countries to be able to produce this um, trained researchers that are able to then collaborate if you want to collaborate with somebody. If you have somebody who is well trained, I think that is a huge space. And I, 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 this is one of those areas that I think um, the diaspora, especially those who are trained in the US, can play a very key role. Training in general, for example, you look at mentorship. Um, we are looking at this in a different way now. So most of the times we ask people to mentor or we request people to mentor, but it's not formalized or we're asking you to mentor out of the goodness of your heart and that can only last so long. So how do we institutionalize mentorship? How do we help people from low and middle income countries, senior professors who have succeeded to really build in the idea of mentoring younger generation that can then come and probably replace them in the future. So we are looking into new ways and into new partnerships to do that uh, effectively. So some of the training programs that we have, um, uh, the one that I really want to emphasize about is this small mentored research uh, grants. So we have probably about 50,000 US dollar grant programs where we give for younger people to do between one to two year type programs. This kind of money in a low resource setting really goes a long way into doing good science. And you've seen from the previous conversation here where it has been emphasized how that is useful. How do you make this program sustainable? We have seeked partnerships. We are exploring new partnerships. There's one around now that is going on between um, uh, Takeda, which is a pharmaceutical, Harvard, which is a cancer center here, Dana Faber, and Aortic uh, ASCR to come together to see how together they can really make these uh, programs flourish in low and middle income countries. Again, you do not have to tr always travel people to the US for this training. There's a model of training, technology enabled um, collaborative training, where we are using or exploring the project ECHO to do training where people stay where they are, bring people together to exchange knowledge, and it is working. I saw an example here that was said earlier where you use technology to really advance training. So finally, to just uh, get this done, I think there are several lessons, and we've heard of them today. One of the uh, ones that really speak to collaboration is the idea of doing research that is mutually beneficial to both parties, and the idea of having equity in that collaboration. And I think it is very, very important 
to really bring people from low and middle income countries onto the table very early on. Most of the things we are doing or we are trying to implement, for example, in most of these low resource settings are things that are developed elsewhere and then we go bring them in here and nobody knows what to do with them or they are not accepted and we are blaming people from those areas. So the idea that bring these people onto the table earlier on I think would be useful. Then leverage existing resources, and in this case, I'm talking, for example, about the HIV platform that has really done very well in Africa. If we can use that platform to really build onto the research capacity, that would be really good. Remember that it takes long-term approach to really build effective collaboration, effective research culture in this institution. So be patient, set realistic goals and realistic measures of those success. Otherwise, if you put $50,000 down and you expect to finish all cancer problems in the world within a year, probably that will not be as successful. You might be disappointed. Thank you very much. Okay, having heard where the money comes from, now let's see how it gets utilized. I have a, uh, invite Ross Burbico, my colleague and friend, to present his talk. Thank you, Mandar. Uh, some really excellent talks today. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers and especially uh, my colleague, Will Ngua, for putting this together. He's done a really amazing job here, and we're all very fortunate to be a part of it. So now we're going to talk about uh, some specific uh, scientific collaborations um, with some potential for uh, making an impact in global health. Uh, so while this is kind of a technical talk, uh, I promise there will be no formulas. Well, maybe, maybe one or two. So uh, this project is born out of many years of collaboration with Varian Medical Systems. Thank you, Dow, wherever you are. Um, so uh, Varian funded projects as well as NCI funded projects uh, to, to do some of this research that I'm gonna show you. So beginning with radiation therapy, um, just a brief uh, primer, uh, Dow showed some images earlier of a clinical linear accelerator, that's what this is right here, and this is kind of the workhorse of radiation therapy, and so I wanted to give a little tour of what's going on here. First of all, there's the radiation delivery device itself, which is coming out of here. Uh, there are image guidance tools, including low energy and high energy uh, x-rays. And offline in another room altogether, there's a whole treatment planning platform and activity that's going on. And each of these components uh, can be very expensive and time intensive and uh, training intensive. And uh, in each of these areas, there's opportunity for uh, developing low cost solutions. And uh, so I believe right after this talk, uh, Dr. Eric Ford will be talking about the radiation delivery side. And tomorrow, Lawrence Court will be talking about the treatment planning work that, uh, that he has done. And so for this talk, I'm going to focus um, only on the, the image guidance piece and how to uh, improve that, hopefully. So what is image guidance and radiation therapy? Let's see if this will work. So here, apologies, Dow, for stealing your graphic. Here is a, a video. Uh, showing uh, an image-guided radiation therapy treatment. So here you see the low-energy X-ray tube there swinging around here, and here comes the low-energy X-ray beam, and here's a flat panel detector. And so capturing X-ray projections from 360 degrees as the gantry moves around, these can then be reconstructed, uh, and, the, and the volumes, the, the, the treatment volumes can be visualized, and uh, the physician or therapist can line the patient up, and then can move uh, the treatment couch uh, to make sure that the tumor is in the right place and so the treatment can uh, proceed safely. All right, let's get out of there. Okay, so is this important? Does this, is this image guidance necessary? Well, it's been demonstrated that image guidance can save lives 
and reduce toxicities. Uh, on the left here, you can see uh, the uh, mistakes or the, or the setup errors that can occur without image guidance on the order of several centimeters. And on the right, when you incorporate online image guidance, you reduce those to the level of millimeters. And what does this increased preci precision mean? Well, it translates to fewer toxicities in the patients, fewer marginal misses, so hopefully less incidence of uh, local recurrence. And then it allows uh, the clinicians to perform dose escalation, more radiation dose for the tumor in these uh, high dose, fewer fraction treatments, uh, which provide really um, much better outcomes. So while this image guidance is really important, it's not consistently available or used in all settings. Uh, some impediments include the cost of this equipment, uh, as well as the, the service required for this equipment and training to use it. So for example, here you can see if this is a linear accelerator and you've got your source here and your panel here, you also have an x-ray generator being used to drive this x-ray source, probably water cooled, so you've got some water pumping action. Uh, you've got your acquisition hardware in another room. And so you have all these different components. These are on these robotic arms that I showed in that video. And if any one of these uh, has an issue, then your image guidance is down. And the consequences of that could be unsafe or less effective treatments and perhaps extended downtime. And that translates into the patient care. So uh, should we remove the, the kilovoltage imager, that those arms that extend out? And, and it's almost like moving back in time to, the, to uh, uh, two decades ago when all we used was this a mega voltage imager, so using the high energy treatment beam for our imaging. Well, let's examine this one. You know, what, what, are, what are some consequences of this? Once, well, you would reduce the purchase costs of the device, uh, reduce the service costs, as I, as I just explained, potentially reducing downtime, and reduce some infrastructure requirements needed to house all that other equipment. So what are the, 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 the benefits, uh, clinical benefits of this? Uh, using this, this beam, the MV beam. Well, you'd have improved penetration for thicker anatomy. Uh, you could have reduced beam hardening and metal artifacts and better HU or Hounsfield unit accuracy for adaptive radiation therapy procedures. However, there are some key technical challenges, including the physics of these uh, MV uh, X-rays. And uh, the detector itself has some key limitations. Uh, so, one approach that I'm going to be discussing here today is to use a lower energy beam so to overcome some of those physics issues. And uh, I'll talk about the design and development and testing of a high energy, uh, a high efficiency imager that we've performed with Varian Medical Systems. And that's this right down here. So, the current MV imager, uh, just to give you a brief tour of it, is composed of three layers, one a copper filter, uh, followed by a scintillator, which, translate, which turns the x-rays into optical light, which can then be absorbed by this uh, photon detector array here, which is not unlike uh, the camera on your phone. So this design is uh, roughly two decades old and hasn't really changed much uh, in that time period. And it, it's generally a low efficiency, so one to one and a half percent at these high energy beams. So what would uh, these uh, cone beam CT images look like with this detector? So with the current detector, and this is what an acquisition would look like. So here you see rotating around. Now instead of using these arms, uh, you're, you're using the, the treatment beam itself, and you're capturing uh, the output here in this panel. And so this is what it would look like with a current imager. This is just a, a contrast phantom, um, which is used to test what different uh, materials of different uh, densities would look like. And so at the same uh, radiation dose, uh, this is the current imager, which you can see is very noisy, and you're missing a lot of uh, low density uh, objects, which could be important uh, in patients. And this is what the KV, the current standard KV would look like, which you can see has much less noise and you can identify these low density objects. So it seems like there's, there's work to be done and uh, that's why many people have, um, 
have uh, concluded that the current MV imager is just not sufficient for clinical image guidance. Oops, on here. So uh, one step in this direction that we've taken is to design uh, a prototype for layer design. Now this is just taking the standard uh, detector that I just described and adding three more of the same layers on it. And what this does is by adding these other layers, you're capturing uh, four times as much of the radiation. So you need, you only, you only, so you can get capture this either the same image with four times less dose, or you can get better images with the same dose. And this is uh, a device that uh, has been built by Varian, and uh, we have the prototype here across the street in our clinic, and we're able to mount it on our linear accelerators here. And so, what uh, do these images look like? So, again, here's the standard. Uh, imager here, and now we're, we're looking at a lower energy, which is available on our uh, clinical linear accelerators, 2.5 MV, and you can see that it's noisy, and uh, it's hard to identify some of these low-density objects. Now with our novel multi-layer imager here in the middle, this is all at the same dose levels, now it's much less noisy, and you can start to identify some of these low-density objects. However, we're still not quite at the level of the KV Comium CT, but we're definitely much closer, and we're getting there. This is what it would look like in a, this is an anthropomorphic pelvis, so this is um, designed to look like a human anatomy, and you can see with a standard imager, it's quite noisy, and um, with many artifacts surrounding the bone here, uh, however, with a new uh, imager, it's, it's much cleaned up, and you can see the anatomy much better. So what other fun things can you do with this detector? Well, because it has four layers, and each four layer can be read out independently, and each layer has a copper filter above it, uh, we recognize that each layer is actually seeing a different part of the spectrum of this MV beam that's coming in. The MV beam coming in is composed of photons of many different energies, and each layer is seeing a different part of that spectrum. And by doing some uh, weighting of the images from each layer, uh, you can start to do some things like identifying certain materials and then bringing them to the fore. For example, uh, here, this is a uh, pelvis phantom with uh, implanted uh, gold markers, which we often use in patients, and you can see that they're very difficult to detect with a standard imager. However, because they're gold and, we're and we know they're gold, we can apply a weighting scheme here to bring out the gold, which has a different density than the tissue and the bone, and we can now identify the markers much more clearly. Here you can see them zoomed in here, and this is looking from the front and this is looking from the side. And so by employing, employing this multi-energy imaging on the same detector, uh, we can start to do some interesting things, improving uh, the imaging in a way that we couldn't do with KV imaging. We're also looking at some other uh, alternatives, including low-cost low cost materials, um, like uh, scintillating glass, and this is uh, something we published earlier this year. Uh, again, this is still work with Varian. Uh, using a pixelated scintillating glass, it's six times more efficient than that single layer that I described earlier. And so now, again, looking at the standard imager here, very noisy, again, can't see these low-density objects, and now with the LKH5, much less noisy, and you really can start to see these objects. And you'd see that with this uh, new scintillating material, we're getting very close to the KV cone beam. Well, now that we have these two alternatives, why not put them together, right? So we, we have the, our standard imager, which is Gauss, which is low efficiency but high resolution, and that LKH5 I described, which is high efficiency but low resolution. If you put them together on the same panel, then you get the best of both worlds. You can get high resolution, high efficiency, which translates to lower dose imager, and that's something we're investigating right now. Some additional uh, MV imaging applications that I'm not really gonna talk about today, that, but again, this is work over the past, say, 15 plus years with Varian. Uh, is using uh, in-treatment verification. Here you can see we can identify a lung tumor in real time and track it. And once you can, once you do know where it is, then you can apply tumor tracking so you can follow the tumor in real time. 
This technology can also be used uh, for quality assurance, uh, capturing the exit radiation so you know what you treated, and then you can translate that uh, to make sure that you, that you have the highest quality treatment. And then you can use that information as well to perform adaptive radiotherapy uh, so that each treatment day you know how much dose you're giving, and then you can change your plan to make sure that uh, at the end uh, you arrive at the dose distribution uh, that you had planned for. So while this is the win-win session, I really see this as a win-win uh, win scenario. Uh, my apologies. So <laughs> involving industry, uh, the local cancer centers, and then the patients themselves. For industry, uh, you have reduced manufacturing costs, a simpler system, potentially uh, the possibility of selling more units. For the cancer centers, uh, that reduced manufacturing cost could be passed on to them, as well as reduced service uh, costs and uh, reduced space uh, requirements, uh, but with the same functionality as what we're going for here. We want the same functionality because we want, this, we want the same uh, ability to treat uh, precisely for the patients. And so for the patients, you have greater machine access. If you have less downtime, you have that precision medicine, and that will all translate into better outcomes. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge all the people here who have worked on this project, as well as our partners with Varian, uh, the NIH, NCI for their funding, uh, and Varian uh, for their support. Thank you. So our next speaker, Eric Ford, is um, unavailable to us today, but he will be here tomorrow. And if you want to interact with him, the chances you will have the opportunity to do so. Uh, the presentation is a five-minute video recording that he sent us. Hello, my name is Eric Ford. I'm a medical physicist and a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm gonna describe a project uh, my team and I are involved in. This is to deliver low cost radiotherapy devices for cancer treatment. So if you don't know what radiation therapy is, let me uh, stop for a minute and explain that and then I'm gonna talk about the device. All right, so here we go. So here's a case study. Here's a patient with a lesion from metastatic cancer in the vertebral body. You can see it here. This is very painful for this patient, but we can treat this with radiation. So here's a treatment, eight gray, delivered over three days, and this patient leaves and the, and the pain will be gone. So this is a palliative treatment, not meant to cure the patient, but it, it avoids all the problems associated with the delivery of a narcotic or an opioid for this patient very common use of radiation. Here's another way we use it, treating this uh, patient who has head and neck cancer, treating the tumor volumes here, staying away from the cord and staying away from the salivary gland, which preserves uh, salivary function and dietary status. So this can be delivered in a very cost-effective way and avoid toxicities. So these are the main advantages. Non-invasive, allows sparing of organs, low risk of toxicity, and overall the costs are low once you're going with radiotherapy. It should be utilized according to various studies at a very high rate. And you look at cancers that are represented in low middle income countries, and you see the utilization rate should be around 80% or so. That's how we use it when the technology is available. But the access is not good across the globe. There are many machines in North America, almost 4,000, but in the continent of Africa, there are about 300 such machines. And per population, the numbers are also not good. In addition to that, there are staffing needs. And here you'll see the great undersupply of medical physicists. It's one of the job description of people that are needed to run and control these devices. So this drives the access to technology, the upfront capital costs, the staff availability, the reliability, 
And you see that play out here. In low-income countries, the equipment is a big percentage of the cost. Also, the staff, even if the salaries are available, the staff is often not available. So that brings us to the requirements. We need devices that are reliable, simple, efficient, and as a result have reduced staffing requirements. However, they also need to be able to deliver high precision radiation therapy. The devices we have now use many moving parts, lots of equipment that can break down. So this is uh, the crux of our project. This is something that's funded by the National Cancer Institute under the Affordable Cancer Technology Program. And our project is partnership with the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi and a commercial partner, Panacea Medical Technologies in Bangalore, India. We're designing a system that's novel. It's a ring-based compensator system to deliver intensity modulated radiation therapy. It works by using printed plastic shells, 3D printed, and these shells are then filled with tungsten beads, which are reusable. The radiation beam goes through this and it's attenuated just where it needs to be attenuated and it delivers a precise radiation dose. These are placed in a ring around the patient and you treat through each of these compensators, which is an extremely efficient way to do this. We've run some simulations. This is a plan of a patient actually treated on a current radiotherapy device in the clinic. And this is our device in the bottom. And you can see you achieve the same kind of sparing that you do in the clinic. But what's interesting is uh, this is on the bottom, this is done with a cobalt 60 beam, and yet the treatment times are very short. So this has never been possible before. And it's done with very few moving parts, very simple device that should provide uh, increased access to this really important technology. All right, with that, I'd like to thank you. I look forward to further discussions that we'll have around this soon. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Paul Nguyen, uh, again, my colleague. And I've had the honor of working with him doing prostate cases. Paul. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. Uh, it's great. It's been such a pleasure and an honor for me to be uh, associated with this incredible conference now and with Will and Ahmed and other leaders for the last at least four years now. And it's such a joy to see all that it's grown into and all that's been accomplished over this very short period of time. And I remember Will when he was just a beginning faculty member walking in through the front door and now about to be associate professor at Harvard and really accomplished so much uh, in terms of bringing people together. And um, what I wanted to tell you a little bit about is uh, a project that we've been working on where uh, this is Will's other life, that uh, not only is he working on bring everybody together here and, and trying to change the world, and also an incredible clinical physicist, uh, but he's also an incredible thinker and a scientist. And we think, uh, I think that there's an opportunity now to really change the face of prostate cancer with what he has done. Um, so we're gonna talk about a, a trial that uh, we've been very interested in running and getting off the ground that actually builds on the work that was done in Will's lab. And this has to do, it's, a, it's an early trial of uh, prostate radiation and smart radiotherapy biomaterials uh, loaded uh, CD40 agonists in combination with a systemic uh, uh, anti-immune or sort of immune stimulator in metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, which is a very difficult disease to treat. There's not really great options for this disease. And I think in Will's vision and mine as well, that this has a real potential for, for cross-ocean collaboration. So his group's innovation really is, is quite incredible. And I've been watching this story for the last several years now. Uh, he's developed this concept of smart radiotherapy biomaterials, he, he and his lab. 
And he's won several awards for this. It's been written up in the Boston Globe. He's getting all these innovator awards for this concept, this idea that you could harvest the immune system in prostate cancer and combine it with radiation to make the immune system fight uh, those cancer cells and really harness it and, and turn it into a weapon against cancer. And Will's innovation was, if you, if you take this, uh, this blue side on the left, th these blue cells are cancer cells. On the right, just to orient you, these are also cancer cells, but they won't have the smart biomaterial that Will's been working on. But on the left, it does. And this smart biomaterial here releases uh, a CD40 agonist. And what this does, it stimulates the immune system. So it stimulates these antigen-presenting cells to sort of pick up whatever's in the environment and use it to prime the immune system against whatever it picks up. Well. Um, what you need then is radiation, and radiation is really the magic here uh, that adds to this, is that when you irradiate this tumor, it starts to die, it sends off these antigens into the, into the area, and with Will's smart radiotherapy biomaterial that's releasing this immune stimulator, it allows the antigen-presenting cells to pick up those fragments of the tumor, travel through the bloodstream, and then land in a lymph node and activate the rest of the immune system to say, hey, if you see this signal, go out and destroy these cells. And so the activated immune system cells, the CD8 here, now can go back to the tumor and help to destroy the tumor uh, that you irradiated. And that's very exciting. But what's really exciting, what's really magical about this, and what really, I think, changes the, the whole face of cancer for our patients with metastatic disease is that you can also take these cells and now attack other cancer cells in the body nowhere near where you radiated. Um, and this, I think, is, is the whole magic of this response, is that you're going to take these immune cells now and turn them against the tumor cells that did not receive any radiation. Because ultimately, when somebody has metastatic disease, you can't radiate every single site. You can't radiate every little point. Uh, and so by using the immune system to attack these cells, we've really harness a whole other set of, uh, uh, of tools. And this concept was so great, it was getting a lot of awards, but what happens actually when you try this in human living, or not in human yet, but in, in living systems? Um, and Will just sort of went and his lab kind of worked on this quietly over the next few years. And so here's a mouse. And just like we saw on the last slide, on the left side is a tumor. And we're going to load it with Will's uh, smart radio biotherapy materials. On the right side is another tumor, or we're not going to load it. So this is sort of a model of, of a mouse that has metastatic disease. And on the left side, it's going to get loaded, and it's going to get radiated. On the right side, nothing. You do absolutely nothing to it. And Will showed me this just, just a few months ago in my office, after he'd been working on it for years. And so what happens here? Well, let's look here. This graph here shows, uh, on this scale, basically how much tumor growth you have. And on this scale, you have time. And so what happens to if you do sort of control to this group? So if you do nothing to this tumor, then the tumor grows. What happens if you treat it with radiation? Well, this is the green line. The tumor grows, but less. So there's some control thanks to radiation. If you put Will's smart radiobiotherapy material in there, um, it grows less than if you do nothing. So that actually has some response. Now what happens if you put the biomaterial together with anti-CD40, which is the thing that's going to stimulate the immune system? Well, that has even more of a response. But then what happens if you add radiation and the biomaterial and the anti-CD40? Well, this has the most response, which is very good. It's kind of what you'd expect, that if you're going to be putting all these things together on a tumor, it's going to respond even more. Okay, so that's great. And I'm sitting in my office, I'm like, Will, that's great. You know, you're able to, to, to show this effect there on the side that you irradiate it. But then he showed me what happens on the side that you don't irradiate. This is the side that you don't touch at all. This green tumor here, which has received no radiation, no smart biomaterial, and no uh, immune stimulant. Well, look what happens. The effect is almost exactly the same. On this side where you've done nothing, the blue is a control. But look at this line here where you put the radiation in on the other side. You put the smart bar material on the other side, and you put the anti-CD40 on the other side. The tumor is controlled, which means that by targeting one tumor in a patient 
in theory, with many metastatic lesions, you can then harness the immune system to go out and destroy the tumors in all of the other lesions in the body without using you know, drugs like abiraterone that costs 10,000 a month and zalutamide that costs 10,000 a month. Uh, and this first, when I saw this, I, my jaw was open for about five minutes and we couldn't proceed with the conversation because I couldn't move my mouth at all. Uh, and so, the excitement then, the, the whole concept of this, to see it not just a concept, but actually something you could test in a living you know, being and actually see this effect was incredible. Um, and so what we've done now is to put all of our resources into trying this in humans. Uh, basically taking Will's innovation and putting it into a clinical trial. We want to be able to test the safety. We want to be able to dose escalate and find out what's the safe dose in humans and see what the effect will be. You know, we have to be realistic. There is certainly a gap between what you can do in a mouse and what will happen in a human. But to me, this is incredibly exciting. Um, and that's why we're working on this. Um, this, is, uh, this is just to show that when you put Will Smart Biomaterial in and it slowly releases this, uh, this anti-CD40, it significantly increases the amount of uh, immune activation compared to if you don't use a smart radio biological material. And so we think that by basically combining these materials, uh, we can lead to significant responses in advanced prostate cancer, which would be a total paradigm change for these patients. Um, first, we're going to test the safety and tolerability, then the objective response rate. Uh, and this is sort of the design. It's like a dose escalation trial, so you have to find the safe dose in humans. Um, but ultimately, it's our vision that this kind of, of, of activity, this kind of thing that Will has developed, is something that you could use in other countries with much less resources than the kind of traditional expensive drugs that we're using. Um, and I know Will has had some discussions with Dr. Ngoma, which uh, we're very excited about as well. Uh, so I could very much see this as a, as a cross-ocean collaboration, as, as one of the first, as a way to get this uh, sort of incredible new way of, of, of treating metastatic disease uh, into patients. So we're very hopeful. That's kind of where we stand right now, extremely hopeful trying to get the trial launched, and excited to work with colleagues across the ocean to, uh, to move on from there. So thanks very much, uh, and I will uh, turn it over to the next speaker, and I'll see you a little bit later tonight. We are not in separate islands and we are comp completing each other. The next speaker is David Kerr. He's not with, with us today, but he's with us with his video. And David Kerr, Professor David Kerr, is a, a known international uh, personality in the field of oncology and is professor in Oxford and uh, the leader and founder of Afrox. It is an uh, initiative for Africa in Oxford, and he is one of the main pillar, uh, pillars of uh, the Win-Win Initiative. He will speak today about Africa Oxford Harfer Clinical Trial Networks. It, is, it was already signed between Will and David Kerr, and we are always this. And we hope that one of the of the first trials will be the work that has just uh, uh, presented by uh, Paul about uh, the work of uh, Will and colleagues. So uh, we can. Hello, I'm David Kerr, Professor of Cancer Medicine. Hello. I'm David Kerr, Professor of Cancer Medicine at the University of Oxford. Uh, I'm Chairman of our wee charity, Afrox. But perhaps more importantly, I'm a friend and sidekick of Ahmed and Wills. Really sorry that I can't be there with you. Um, as you're having your wonderful meeting, I'll be speaking and lecturing in China, where I'm doing a lot of work just now with the Health Ministry. What I really wanted to talk about and explore with you is how we might collaborate to build a clinical research network in those interested centres and countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, one of the things that I learned um, working 
oh, many moons ago as health advisor to Tony Blair, was that um, networks in a very strong way, both of delivering cancer care and of supporting cancer research. When we looked at our national cancer plan when it was first conceived, uh, one of the key elements of this was to develop a, a hub and spoke model linking cancer centres, those which were comprehensive, which had specialist surgery, radiotherapy, with um, um, with cancer units in which perhaps a bulk of surgery would be given, um, perhaps a bulk of treatment, some chemotherapy, um, but with strong referral pathways, strong patient pathways, linking the hospitals together. When we built that network for uh, the delivery of cancer care, uh, not surprisingly it followed that this is an excellent way for us to uh, work together to develop research protocols and to recruit patients. Um, we did this in India. Um, we set up a trials network called INDOX, which with some fantastic colleagues, we uh, linked India's top 10 public cancer hospitals um, uh, looking, uh, developing an early clinical trials network, uh, very successfully with support from, uh, some support from government, but predominantly from the pharma industry. Uh, we did a very good job in training young Indian oncologists in research procedures, many of whom came to uh, work with us in Oxford, but working with some fantastic PIs in some of the uh, best cancer hospitals in Asia. Um, we built and delivered a clinical trials network successfully. So I wonder if we could work to do the same together in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have some fantastic resources, you have the wonderful Will, um, all that he commands through Harvard. Uh, Oxford has a great tradition of delivering um, large, simple clinical trials which are well respected uh, around the world. Uh, of course, I can count Sir Richard Peter as a friend, I think the world's leading cancer epidemiologist and statistician, um, who really invented the concept of large, compelling, well-powered clinical trials. Um, it, the network thing would be important. I think that there is training, I think there are resources, I think there's support that we could offer from uh, from our centre. I, I'm sure from uh, the other well-supported centres that are attending the meeting. And I think in a partnered model with perhaps the, uh, the national cancer centres in those countries that wish to collaborate, we could pull a network together uh, we could organise training modules, we could bring all of us up to date in terms of our GCP training, we could build in the excellent work that's been going on in, in many countries, particularly Nigeria, Uganda, in terms of building an ethical framework that supports the use of clinical trials, which allows us to, um, in a moral and ethical way, recruit patients to high quality studies. Now, of course, there are good examples of um, joint collaborations between individual centres and hospitals linking north and south. But this is thinking about a more comprehensive network that if we bandied together that band of brothers and sisters um, potentially would allow us to go to major pharma for funding to help build infrastructure, training and so on. Uh, and of course um, to work with us um, perhaps providing us with interesting drugs um, allowing us the, the ability to explore questions which are most relevant to our colleagues who are practicing cancer medicine um, in those countries. So applying um, either old drugs, teaching them new tricks, or getting access to new drugs for tumour types which are particularly relevant. Um, it may also just be us putting patients into large multinational global cancer trials. Um, this would be a good thing too. Um, but I'd be very interested to see what you thought of this. Uh, I would love to be able to help develop the idea and um, to bring our weight to bear, not only from Oxford, of course, but from those other great representatives who are sitting in the room with you just now. But if you thought there was an appetite and interest, I would be very happy to work with you to see how 
we can learn from the mistakes that we've made, many, and how we can build on the strengths that we perceive, but above all, how we can work together to collaborate. Um, we define a network as a geographically disparate, spread group of individuals who share a common aim. And one thing that binds us all together is a desire to do all that we can to improve the lot of our cancer patients. And clinical translational research plays a terribly important part in that journey. Listen, thanks for listening. Sorry again I can't be with you, but, but I'm sure, I hope, that this message resonates and we have an opportunity to work together to see how we can construct this um, clinical cancer research network. Thanks very much for the time being over and out. Thank you. As you see from the message of my friend, David Kerr, we have now training for clinical research. He's led by him and he's online, we have certificate, and we have the network to apply. What is, what, what, what is lacking is contribution of all. We have the network now, the network for research and the training. And now the Global University, uh, uh, or, or Global Oncology University, and there is track for training for clinical research, and there is a network to apply. This is complete, this completed circle, with not separated island. I have the pleasure to present now uh, uh, Dr. Clark Thibodeau, Director of Scientific Affairs, C Cures Within Reach, Cure Accelerator. It's very interesting, really, uh, organization or foundation, and we, well, yesterday we had uh, uh, nice events with the repurposed drugs, and this is one of the very important uh, uh, new approaches. It's not new, it is old, but it needs some new pe people to adopt it and to fi find f finance for it, find funds and to apply this. So thank you for your uh, cure within reach and thank you for all, for all what you are doing. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to be here today, and I want to thank the Harvard Global Health Catalyst Summit for um, inviting us here. Uh, to Will Ngua and to Lydia Sana for organizing this, and to all of you for um, staying here uh, a little past four to hear my talk, so thank you. Um, again, my name is Claire Thibodeau. I'm the Director of Scientific Affairs with Cures Within Reach. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about our organization, about repurposing research, or as you heard it referenced as in the uh, previous video, Cheating Old, Drug new, old Drugs, New Tricks. And an initiative that we are just launching for the low and lower middle income countries. So, for those of you who aren't familiar with Cures Within Reach, we're a nonprofit based in Chicago. We've been around for um, about uh, 15 years now, working specifically in repurposing research. So, we, uh, what we do is we leverage existing science and medicine so that we can. Um, use that to drive more treatments to more patients more quickly. We have a couple different roles in our, um, as an organization. The first thing we are is a value-driving catalyst of this research. We bring the many different stakeholders together to make sure that these important research opportunities happen. We're also a uh, value-driving facilitator. Um, we have a online platform, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, it's called Cure Accelerator, where um, researchers can put their repurposing research ideas, and we can make sure that uh, they all come together, um, bringing together other stakeholders in that. And we also foster conversation and collaboration around repurposing research. So before we get any further, I just want to have some definitions out there so that we're all making sure we're talking about the same thing. Um, when we talk about repurposing, what we mean is taking drugs, devices, nutraceuticals, and diagnostics 
that have been approved by a regulatory agency. It could be the FDA, it could be the EMA, it could be a different governmental organization. Um, but these are um, therapies that have been proven to be safe and effective for humans. And the research we support then tests those same uh, therapies in a different indication. This is different from repositioning or rescue, which is um, when a drug has made it through some clinical uh, phase of clinical trials, maybe it made it to phase two, but then was shelved because it wasn't effective in a particular indication, and then it's taken off the shelf and used uh, in a different indication. So that's a uh, therapy that's never been approved, that's repositioning or rescue. Um, commercial opportunities are when um, there's ability to make a profit for an organization by bringing a repurposed therapy through regulatory approval. And um, the majority of what we fund tend to be philanthropic. So these are opportunities where a drug uh, does not necessarily have commercial value, a therapy does not necessarily have commercial value, but by supporting the research, um, it's available for uh, doctors and their patients to use off-label. So we're providing the kind of the studies, the research that proves that it couldn't, can work in different indications. So we started off as an organization that focused on translational research in general. And what we found was when we looked back at all the studies that we had funded, um, of the ones, only 10 happened to be repurposing, not because we meant to fund repurposing research, but because we thought these were really great projects. And of those 10, four were already making an impact in the clinic. And that's when we had our aha moment, where we were saying, okay, if we really want to make patient impact, repurposing is the way to do it. And that's when we began to focus on that specifically. Um, we know that repurposing is faster to clinic because there is more known about safety um, and the research can be done at a much lower cost than de novo drug development. So it really makes a lot of sense to us um, to focus on repurposing specifically to create that patient impact. Now repurposing as a as Ahmed said, is not a new idea. It's been around for a while. And this is just a table to show some examples of how repurposing has happened. Um, but it's not necessarily been discussed as a, as a real strategy to address unmet patient needs. And, um, you know, to me that seems strange because repurposing does have a lot of different advantages. First of all, it can be done in almost any disease. We've heard some talk here today about you know, non-communicable diseases versus communicable diseases in uh, low and lower middle income countries. Repurposing can slot in in any of these conditions. And we're really working with evidence-based outcomes. Because these drugs are available for doctors and patients to use right now, um, the research is really based on clinical evidence, you know, what we see in the clinic. And that clinical evidence can come even before mechanism action is known. Sometimes we're not exactly sure why a repurposed therapy works. And to be honest, patients don't really care. They only care that it's helping them. And so if a clinical impact is seen, then researchers can go back and start to look at mechanism of action and see what's going on and then build from there. Again, if it's a, a generic drug that's uh, already available, um, Off-label use is a great way for um, a ther therapy to be adopted, and um, I'll give an example of that in a little bit. And in the United States, we do have an accelerated approval through the FDA when, um, when we're talking about repurposed therapies. So there are some really strong advantages. However, there are also some challenges that go with repurposing. Um, unlike oncology or neurology, there's really no centralized way that repurposing is uh, done in research institutions that, uh, where um, people organize around repurposing. They tend to happen in little pockets in university universities. It'd be great if one day we could have a department of repurposing just like uh, any other indication. And when we are talking about this kind of research, Finding financial 
uh, support can be very challenging. Um, one example we like to give, completely made up example, is what if there was a researcher who had the idea that aspirin could cure lupus? That'd be really great for everybody who had lupus, but who's gonna fund that research when you could walk into any pharmacy and buy any um, brand of aspirin off the shelf? So that's an extreme example, but it really does illustrate some of the financial challenges that can come when we're talking about repurposing research. Um, the next one is one that always gets my goat. Uh, a lot of times, repurposing is not seen as innovative. If a researcher is taking a drug that's been around for 30, 40 years, you know, sometimes when we're, um, when it's a project that they're pitching to a funding organization or maybe trying to get um, approval to study within their own department even, they may, be, they may be told, you know what, that's not really innovative. What's the new drug? What's the exciting new breakthrough that you're gonna find? And while I'm not at all saying that those types of breakthroughs aren't important, we believe that researching or uh, repurposing research is just as innovative. And then finally, um, sometimes it can be challenging to change clinical practice without doing these kind of confirmatory research studies so that uh, the data can be published in a medical journal so that physicians can look to that research, research, uh, research, find that data, and feel comfortable recommending it for their patients. So I said, as I said, Cures Within Reach has been doing this um, for a number of years now, and we've been able to really make some patient impact. Um, these are just some uh, metrics about the impact of our work. There's a couple that I'd like to point out to you in particular. Um, we've funded nearly 50 different, uh, different diseases. We are a disease agnostic organization, so to us it doesn't matter what disease, it just matters if it's repurposed research. Um, we funded over 80 projects and we've invested over six million dollars in funding. But that six million has led to 47 million in follow-on funding. So again, we are the catalyst. We come in at an early stage, um, usually that first in human um, concept, testing these repurposed therapies, and then with the data from the funding that Cures Within Reach provides, researchers are able to go on to the NIH, to uh, disease-specific organizations, to other philanthropic funders, and get the money they need to do a larger study. Um, the other thing I would like to point out that of our 13, um, uh, that of all of our projects that we funded, we have 13 different diseases that have been improved um, through work done by Cures Within Reach. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of those for you right now. Um, the first was one of our earliest success stories. This is a pediatric autoimmune disease. It's a rare disease. And these kids who have this, um, it's ALPS, autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, but I'll just call it ALPS for short. Um, they get very ill. They spend a lot of months in the ho or a lot of days per month in the hospital. Um, the healthcare costs are quite large to take care of these children, and they don't really have a very good outlook. We funded a researcher at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia who had this idea to take sirolimus, which is a drug used um, for kidney transplants, to help these kids. And what he found out was that by giving these kids two pills a day, they were able to go ahead and leave almost normal lives. And in this picture, uh, you see Nicole, you see her um, up in the top left corner as a young child undergoing treatment, and now you see her as an 18-year-old who's really gone on to grow and thrive. And so, you know, we're really proud of that work. In the cancer community, we had a, a project at the University of Chicago that was actually using a device. They took a device that had been approved for treating laser cysts and tried it in uh, prostate cancer, early stage prostate cancer. And what they found was that by using this device, they were able to um, do a phase uh, one study that showed that um, a minimally invasive procedure was able to produce um, durable responses in these um, men who had early stage prostate cancer. Again, using the data from that study, they were able to write a grant at the NIH and received uh, almost 
$650,000 in funding to do a larger confirmatory trial. And this procedure is now being used at the University of Chicago and other institutions. So I mentioned Cure Accelerator. That is our online platform dedicated to repurposing research. Um, again, we've had, we have over 300 projects posted on Cure Accelerator. Uh, we post our request for funding proposals there. And we have many different types of projects, including a large number of oncology. Currently, 32% of, 32 of our 22 ongoing projects come from the oncology space. Um, that's seven total. You can see them listed here. And they cover um, brain cancer, lung cancer, thyroid cancer, and side effects from cancer treatment. Again, we're disease agnostic, so uh, this is the range of all kinds of different um, disease areas that we fund. And you'll notice that right now, our funding is limited to North America and Europe. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, how we're going to change that. And again, our recently completed research. So back in 2017, we held one of our Cure Accelerator Live events, which is our philanthropic pitch competition, where PIs come, they present their repurposing research ideas, and um, the attendees will then vote on the winning project. This was focused strictly in cancer, repurposing research in cancer. We had a number of different um, institutions and investigators apply, five finalists, and we were able not only to fund the winner, which was the metastatic thyroid cancer project, but then we were able to eventually work and um, find funding for our runner-up, which is um, a brain cancer trial. Now, last night, we had an event just like that, except the projects were focused on making impact in low and lower middle income countries. So quick show of hands, who here attended last night? All right, that's a pretty good portion. Well, thank you all for coming out. Um, I hope you found it as exciting and engaging as I did. Um, those of you who were there know that the winning project, it was the um, uh, project that repurposed um, fecal microbiota transplantation for secute, uh, severe acute malnutrition in South Africa. And this is a really great project looking at uh, the difference of gut micro microbiota and, biota and um, kids who are treated with nutritional substance, uh, uh, nutritional therapy, but still don't recover from this malnutrition. And so now they're using FMT as a supplement to help these kids um, thrive, as the name of the study says. So thank you all for coming out. And this was our first foray in working in low and lower middle income countries, and a lead up into our new pilot program, which is called the Regrow Pilot. Regrow stands for Repurposing Grants for the Rest of the World. And our idea with this project is to provide repurposing research grants to clinicians and researchers who are in these low and lower middle income countries to build capacity within the countries and to find treatments for those patients in those countries. So why Regrow? We were actually approached by one of our uh, farmer partners with this um, idea of really leveraging the power of repurposing in low and lower middle income countries because the need for scientific capacity building and access to treatment are highest in these countries, yet most of the research um, investment is focused in other parts of the world. And by providing these kinds of grants, we can do a, a lot of different uh, meet a lot of different goals. We can build capacity for research in these countries. We can solve problems locally and support retention of scientific talent within low and lower middle income countries. So uh, we spent about six months working with um, partners from global health um, academic pro uh, programs, working with philanthropic and not-for-profit partners, industry partners and others to kind of talk about what might this program look like. And we came up with some ideas around um, some parameters. So for the pilot, eligible projects will serve um, any unmet medical need. Again, keeping the disease agnostic idea of the Cures Within Reach mission, 
while at the same time, you know, we don't really know what we don't know, and we want to make sure that we capture as wide a net as possible. Again, these can be um, diseases like malaria, TB, cancer, heart conditions, rare disease, whatever a researcher in low and lower middle income countries sees as a need. Um, projects will utilize generic or off-patent drugs only and will also include nutraceuticals and indigenous medicines in these, um, in these uh, projects as long as the therapy is available in country. We want to do research that can then actually move into the clinic and not have to worry about um, the drug pipeline. Um, we're looking for clinical research projects with uh, English submissions and submitting using our Cure Accelerator platform. Uh, the types of institutions we're going to work with is what we've come up with uh, a term as being research ready. So again, it's the um, applying researcher must come from a lower, lower middle income country as uh, defined by the World Bank. Um, have, having received previous external third party clinical research funding, um, have an IRB or an equivalent in place, um, follow WHO's GLC, GCLP, and GCP guidelines, and then have past or current experience with human or clinical research. Again, since this is a pilot, we want to make sure that we do everything that we can to make it as successful as possible. So we are in the beginning stages of our Regrow pilot program. And um, we have a few next steps, and I promise they're not all ones. On my computer at home, it did say one, two, three. Um, although I guess you could say they're all top priorities, I guess. Um, the first thing is outreach to NGOs for best practices and for connections to institutions in low and lower middle income countries. We're the first to admit that we are new to this world, and we need your help. We need your help in making those connections. We need your help in understanding uh, best practices and uh, making sure that we do everything we can to make the launch of our request for proposals when that happens as successful as possible. In addition, we're looking for um, researchers, clinicians who have experience to help us review the proposals when they come in. Again, we're a disease agnostic organization. We do understand North America and Europe, but as we've heard here just in the talks, cancer is not always the same in the US as it might be in, in Africa. So we are looking to those who have that experience who can help us understand those differences. And then finally, and uh, last but not least, uh, we are raising money for this regrow pilot right now. Our goal is to get um, enough funds going so that we can have at least three initial grants of roughly $25,000 to $50,000 each. So again, I just want to thank everybody for their attention. We'd love to talk to you more about this, pro this pilot. If you are interested in getting involved, if you have connections, if you know people, please let us know. Um, you can see more information at our website. My information is here, and um, I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to learn more. So thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. And this is real, really a, a new partnership with uh, Repurpose and uh, Cure Within Reach with Harfa Global Health Catalyst and with the win-win. It is really applied way of win-win. Now we have a coffee break, but please, please, it's just 10 minutes. We have after about 1 million. <laughs> very interesting, very, very interesting showcases in the real world about uh, uh, projects and uh, uh, many, many interesting uh, pro projects, showcases. So please, just 10 minutes. Thank you. I have the pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the second part, 
Professor Alvaro Luango. He will speak about uh, implemented uh, 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 model, uh, some other model for, a radio, for uh, 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 implementation of radiotherapy on Uruguay. Please, Dr. Alvaro Luango. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Thank you for the possibility to talk with you about a project. It's a project, really. It's a project because this project has five years. It's necessary to understand our country. Our country is a small country in Latin America. We have more or less three million inhabitants uh, between two very big countries, Argentina and Brazil. We have a different political. E today in the morning, uh, our friend Eduardo talked about that we have a president that is an oncology. But uh, this is important. But the important is to think different. You know this map. This map is the number of radiotherapy machine per million inhabitants the the IAEA, no? And Uruguay is another country, but the situation is no economical. Is in the government for many many years seen different. Seen different, but if you think only in the number of linear accelerators, it's not enough. I don't understand because the international organisms talk about numbers because it's necessary to know the technology, not the numbers. It's necessary to consider another factor. Consider the geo manufacture, the available techniques of energy, collimator, etc. But also it's necessary to consider the analysis, the analysis of the you have quality management system, quality control, number of simulators, a qualified personnel between others. 15 machines. But our country don't have the possibility to do a good calibration. It's necessary to send the dosimetries outside the country. Two years ago, we have a new secondary standard laboratory. This is very important. I think this is the more important that you have the possibility to do the calibration of your machine in your country. Because it's a, this dependence is very dangerous. This question is very important. What the international organization do for technology transfer? Yes, a lot. But today, one person to talk, go to Vienna, return to Vienna. Go to Vienna, return to Vienna. This is very important. But I, I think that another speaker talk about Einstein also. I talk about Einstein. It's necessary to change to think. If you know change, it's not possible to obtain results different. Another question. What are the politics of the technology update? Exist. Which country and how they accompany the inversion of radiotherapy? It's very difficult that the country, the government, accompany the inversion. How the country update the cost of radiotherapy? Because you change the technology, you change the cost. Many, many countries don't change the cost. In the inversion of radiotherapy, it no exists. I talk about the private, for example. What do we insert the new technology? It, this is a, a very important problem. Thinking different. One third of the cancer can be prevented. The country is not prevent cancer is 
a bad condition for uh, the control of the cancer. Early and time diagnosis is technology transfer. I'm going to talk about technology transfer. The clock is terrible. <laughs> I'm the first speaker with the clock. Eh? <laughs> to buy or not to buy? This is the question. We are not the first. Another reality. Because another people think the same form. Our conclusion, it, in our conclusion, may be extrapolated, but they need an analysis, analyze why. Because the reality of the, each country is different. It, this is the reality for my country, but I don't know this reality is really extrapolated for another country in another situation. But it's one experience. And this experience is interesting because I study the cost in the budget of, um, in my hospital. The experience of the National Cancer Institute beginning because five years ago it was a necessary update radiotherapy technology. We de decide to lease and not to buy new machine. We lease the last technology available in that moment through an international bidding. Why do you think about the solution? We need the necessary fund for purchase. We are not available. The hospital say, I don't have the money. OK. You have guarantee? No. I don't have the possibility to my government say, I have guarantee for this inversion. But I need introducing the technology, as soon possible. It's very difficult and expensive to have properly preventive maintenance and corrective maintenance of our equipment. Clearly, it's a problem for the public, uh, for the public uh, health. It's important to, to, to take in consideration the problem relative to technology update in the, in the near future. In the budget total of the institute, of the, my hospital, the oncology drug is 42%. Cost of the drug, the medical material, 8%. And the radiotherapy machine, the two accelerator, 8%. This is the reality of the budget in my hospital in Uruguay. This is a, a number that we have for the calculation. We have two accelerators, we have uh, this, uh, you have the numbers. We have more or less 100 applications per day per LINAC. Application is what push the bottom of the machine or the, or the clip, no? One, you need four, for, for example, for a pelvis treatment, no? The Linux lease, the Linux lease is more or less $10 for each moment that you push the bottom. What is the cost, total cost of the radiotherapy application? The push button. The push button is $30 because in this cost, do you have all the people that work, the energy, the, the parts, all. But the lease is 9.91. is 32% of the application value. This is the point that is very interesting. Cost. If you compare lease and purchase, you notice that the cost is similar. Weight is similar in these five years. It's possible that in, in the next five years, uh, the cost of the lease is increased and the cost of the another machine decreased. But I don't know. This is our experience now. Highlights. No capital is need. Immediate introduction of the technology. Serving as part included in the lease contract. And the point more important. 
34, guarantee of continuous treatment. In our case, for contract, 2% of the time operation. Thank you for your attention. And the last word. It's possible that the solution are not the excellent solution. But I think this is possible to try it uh, to use this concept. concept. To buy or not to buy, I prefer to lease. Thank you. Now I have the pleasure of to present Kingsley, Dr. Kingsley Nudo, University of Washington, who will speak about the, uh, the project of Ondo State, that it will be done and is going under the patronage of Her Excellency, the First Lady of Ondo State. Please. So as you all recognize, I, I spoke in place of the First Lady in the morning. Uh, so I think uh, she would come to the stage and speak about the, to tell you more about the project in Ondo. She's, there's no better person to talk about that than, than the First Lady. Please welcome her to the stage. Good evening, distinguished um, professors and um, researchers in oncology, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Honored to be here. This is my second time of participating in Harvard Global Health Catalyst. And um, it's really an honor that I've been invited for the second time. It follows that um, I'm now part of the family, and that's exciting. And I would like to appreciate Will for counting me worthy to be part of this fantastic forum. I must submit that um, the work he's doing in conjunction with Professor Ahmed and all the members of this Global Health Catholics Forum is fantastic. And I want to believe that there is a commitment to bridge the cancer divide between the industrialized world and low-income countries like mine. And I'm glad to have met all of you. It is crystal clear that the cancer divide does exist in our world today. Um, the burden in sub-Saharan Africa especially Nigeria that I come from, is a sad story to say the least. Without any intention to bore you with the statistics, you will be shocked to know that every single day in Nigeria, 39 women are diagnosed of cervical cancer and 22 of them die on that same day. For the breast cancer is worse, about 36 women die daily. Although poor awareness and prevailing myths about what causes like breast cancer that I'm very familiar with and how it can be treated, you all know that we are still battling with breast cancer being caused by 
witches and wizards, spiritual attack. And instead of our women going to the hospital, they go to prayer warriors that will take them to the mountain. The Nigerians here can see you're nodding, and that's it. And you won't believe that that's a lot in 2019. I'm not talking about 1950s, 2019. People still think that they have to pray away lump on top of the mountain. So we really need to focus more. I know it's important to build hospitals and all that, but and I think all the time I've always strongly felt that the entry point for us is awareness, is education, is education. That will enable our women to come early. That will enable our women to present early. Like I said, although the poor awareness and prevailing myths, uh, they are problematic, but the dysfunctional state of our, the few cancer centers, I don't think they're even centers, they're just departments. You agree with me? They are departments of uh, the whole uh, hospital setting. We don't really have cancer treatment center as you have it in America, but I believe that with time, it will be done. Together with other local NGOs, and the one that I founded 22 years ago, after I was diagnosed with breast cancer and survived, we, we, are, we played uh, a major role in raising awareness, and we continue to do so especially those of us who passed through that experience and um, came out still feeling whole, came out feeling like a human being. And people would always ask you, what did you do? And for that reason, I will continue to tell people what I did. The simple answer present that painless lump to your doctor. Don't go anywhere. Don't go to church and don't go to that herbalist. Go to your doctor. And the doctor that you go to is a specialist because we also emphasize that not all doctors treat breast cancer. They are specialized doctors or specialists or experts that will handle it so that you don't be through like we say in my place, going to a GP that will take your money and butcher you in the name of surgery. So we do have a lot of problems and we are trying all our best as NGOs to educate our people but we need help. It's not easy. We don't have, for instance, um, structured uh, screening program, which I believe the Global Catalyst family will look into. Uh, much as we want to have a standard uh, treatment centers, we don't want the treatment we get, for instance, in Nigeria to be compromised. We want the same standard as it obtains in America and elsewhere. But we need to have a screening program. And that will also help us in whatever plan we want in terms of controlling, for instance, breast cancer in Nigeria. Where you don't have this screening I'm talking about, not what we have in Nigeria. Few NGOs, when they have small grant, you see them, they organize a screening program, and after that, that's the end of the show. It's 
disjointed, no guidelines, no nothing. I'm using this opportunity to say that we need it. Our friends, like the global, Harvard Global Health Catalyst, you are a friend, so you can always step in. We have a need to have a planned screening program in Nigeria. If we can do it nationwide, we can start with a state like Ondo State. Ondo State is very serious about controlling cancer. And I believe that screening should also be part of the whole process to make it a reality. So I want to say here that my position as the first lady of Ondo State um, has placed me at an advantage because if, if people didn't want to listen to me as a breast cancer advocate, which I was and I'll continue to be before the office of First Lady, but that position, I'm, I'm leveraging on it. People will want to listen to me People who want to do business with me. Therefore, I have, maybe I can use the word, exploited that position to market the need for a state government to set up its own comprehensive cancer treatment center. Because I knew right from time it could be something that a state that is serious, a state that is concerned about the health of its citizenry, especially the women, can do if we're able to do the lobby. Okay. Can do the lobby, which we did anyway. And um, usually if you want to get states on board to do anything, you must make sure that they understand what you're trying to do, and they now budget for that money. Because without budgeting for the money, you can scream from today to tomorrow to support whatever cause you believe in and nobody will listen to you. So we success successfully got that done. And today, uh, on those state, is said to have a cancer treatment center, and we've been able to secure a land in a health facility, Federal Medical Center in Owo. And you know, for, for such um, a facility to function in a sustainable manner, you need to have uh, human resources that are capable to run the place. So the capacity building is very paramount in what we are doing, and I'm happy to inform you that um, Harvard Global Catalyst has stepped in. Um, uh, Professor Ngwa came like a month or two ago to sign MOU to ensure that those that work in that center are properly trained. Cancer treatment center is a lot of money. And I won't stand here to say that Ondo State has all the money. No, but at least there's a commitment financially. And there is also a political will. If nobody is interested in doing that, at least my husband is committed 100%, having passed through the experience indirectly with me. So I can assure you the political will is there to do it, but we will keep on reaching out to our friends that can also support us financially. There are quite a number of rich Nigerian, Nigerians at home and in diaspora that we are reaching out to support us, to donate money, Quite a number of them, they have money, but they don't know what to do with it. 
So we need to market this idea that is, 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 is that money will be utilized to save lives in our country. So I'm seizing this opportunity to let you know that that center is a task that must be done and we are fully committed to get it done. Thank you for listening. Now, the video. Now, we have a bright example from Africa, from Rwanda. Uh, I have the pleasure to, this is video by uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Diane Gashumba, Minister of Health in Rwanda. And he's also, she is also ambassador, honorary ambassador of Win Win Initiative. And uh, our colleague, Dr. Pacific Muganzi, in the military hospital. And you will see here a bright example, Some, something from below zero, really below zero, to something uh, growing. Now they are in uh, uh, soft uh, running. And the plan is to, to, to cover all Rwandan people from Rwanda in the upcoming year, and maybe after seven or eight years, to to receive patients from outside, and maybe uh, uh, some colleagues come from Switzerland and from Bavaria. They, they say that we have no objection if to be treated in Rwanda, where, where, uh, if it goes like this. This is a bright example. Uh, uh, and this is now adopted by uh, President Paul Kagame. And we went uh, with Will uh, last time in November, said the plan is OK, is uh, still adopted by the president. They say, yes, so OK, welcome to be ambassador in, in Win Win Initiative. We need a, 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 a real examples. We need a, a bright works. So the video. Delighted to share with all of you the national plan to fighting cancer, uh, starting by the effort the government of Rwanda has put in place uh, in regard to prevention of cancer. Uh, we have uh, prioritized uh, mass uh, campaigns across the country to make sure that everyone uh, knows about the burden of cancer, knows uh, how to prevent cancer, but also. Uh, everyone get informed on the importance of getting uh, screened at an early stage. Because most of the time in Africa, what we see, what we notice is that people get screened and diagnosed at a late stage and uh, nothing can be done. Today we have what we call an initiative, we call uh, CAFRI Day, where we exercise, uh, everyone exercise uh, from the town to the village everyone meet and we pack our cars and we do uh, physical exercises. And during this uh, CAFRI Day initiative, we also take uh, the opportunity to disseminate key messages around non-communicable diseases, including cancer. And uh, we also do screening in collaboration with public hospitals, but also private uh, clinics and uh, facilities. They all join the Ministry of Health effort to uh, screen people. In addition to this, uh, with the community-based health insurance that is serving 91% uh, of the people of Rwanda, uh, men above uh, 40 years and women above uh, 35 years are allowed to uh, do a medical checkup, including cancer screening, every year. So we mobilize people, we sensitize people so that they know that they have this opportunity. Rwanda has also initiated a human papilloma virus uh, vaccine since 2011. And today our young ladies from 12 years old are vaccinated and the coverage is at uh, 94%. We have also initiated the uh, vaccine uh, against uh, hepatitis B 
and the coverage also is, is good, is more than 90%. Uh, we have um, uh, put in place clear regulations and laws around tobacco consumers. And uh, we have recently banned shisha. This is uh, uh, around prevention. But the most important thing, we put uh, emphasis on, uh, on uh, uh, awareness and campaigns across the country using our, our local leaders, but also using our 60,000 community focus that have been trained on uh, how to deliver uh, key messages around, uh, around prevention. Uh, with regard to screening, we have 50% uh, of our health facilities that were equipped with uh, the capability, with uh, the knowledge, but also the equipment, the required equipment to be able to screen for uh, especially uh, cervical cancer and breast cancer. Those are actually the main uh, causes of cancer we have in Rwanda. The good news is that today we have established the nas National uh, Cancer Registry that will allow us to have uh, accurate data on the prevalence and the incidence of uh, cancer in Rwanda. With regard to treatment, that is remaining a challenge, uh, especially because of uh, the affordability of the drugs. And they're trying to partner with the pharmaceutical industries to ensure that uh, Rwandans access to cancer drugs at an affordable uh, cost, as we did for diabetes with uh, our good partners, including uh, Novartis. We are trying to reach out to partners to ensure that uh, as we screen, as we, as we put in place uh, equipment and facilities to screen, we have uh, uh, an alternative to offer to uh, people who will be screened positive for any type of cancer. So today we have uh, equipped some of our referral hospitals and uh, even district hospitals with um, uh, means to, to, to treat for cancer. Some of our hospitals are offering chemotherapy and surgical treatment. Others are offering surgical treatment only. And uh, very soon we'll have uh, more hospitals offering chemotherapy. We are happy to announce that uh, we recently established a very nice uh, facility in the Rwanda Military Hospital that will be offering radiotherapy treatment to Rwandans but also to surrounding countries. We still have gaps, we still have challenges, and uh, we need good partners to support us uh, to ensure that, uh, as I said, uh, cancer drugs are affordable, are cheap, are accessible to everyone, and we still need to train more uh, human resource, more uh, health providers to make sure that they provide uh, chemotherapy as it should be. We also need to complement this uh, radiotherapy center with uh, a PET scan machine. They don't have a PET scan machine and we keep mobilizing uh, within our own resource as a government, but we welcome any, any support from uh, good partners. Uh, the, another good news is that recently, actually last year during the World Health Assembly, Rwanda was uh, included uh, specifically, uh, our Kigali city was included uh, among the city challenges uh, uh, initiative and uh, we signed the MOU with our partners. We, the MOU was signed this year, uh, in March this year. And this is a great opportunity to us because it will allow us to really assess, uh, assess the gaps we have in um, our facilities and also it will open doors to uh, 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 possible partnerships to address these gaps. So I really thank you very much for the uh, opportunity uh, given to Rwanda to share our experience and also to, to learn from others. Thank you very much. And there is a memorandum uh, of understanding between Harvard Global Health Catalyst and the Ministry of Health of Rwanda. Now. Okay, so it's my honor to welcome Dr. Dennis Palmer. He is the, he's the professor and dean of Mbingo Baptist Hospital in Cameroon. Uh, they are doing excellent work uh, in Cameroon, which is a very challenging place for oncology. So 
I know everyone will be interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank so you. Yeah. Uh, thank, well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present our uh, project at Mbingo. Uh, it is a little bit improbable that um, we are undertaking this. Uh, uh, Mbingo is a, uh, it's a traditional um, mission hospital. We're part of the Baptist Health System in Cameroon, which is the second largest provider in the country after the government. Uh, and Bingo is uh, a hospital was founded in 1952 as a leprosy uh, settlement, and over the years it has developed into uh, a referral teaching hospital. Uh, in 2007, we started offering uh, postgraduate medical education there with a surgical residency, and in uh, in 2008, we started an internal medicine uh, residency. <clears throat> and so um, what happened to us is that uh, cancer care is very difficult for patients, uh, especially patients who don't have resources. As you know, all across Africa, this is a problem. So patients started to come to us. And, and um, actually, I want to go back. I want to show you one. How do I go back here? A very, um, yes, uh, I wanted to show you, this is the setting of the hospital and there's a very important thing here to point out. If you look uh, far in the right upper corner across the valley, there's a village over there and that is the village of Bafut. And it's world famous primarily because Professor Ngwa, that's his home village. And so I wanted to point that out to you. Um, anyway, we, we started doing um, uh, elementary cancer treatment. We, have, we developed, because we have postgraduate surgical training, we developed a, a high quality surgery program. Um, one of the things that really transformed us was in about uh, 2010, uh, we, uh, Dr. Barden joined us. And uh, he is an internist, but also trained, fully trained as a pathologist. And so he introduced pathology services. And it turned out that it was very difficult for patients with tumors uh, in Cameroon to get a, an, a diagnosis easily. And so uh, our reputation as a place where you could go and get treatment, uh, or at least get a diagnosis and then some treatment uh, developed. And um, this has transformed us. Uh, we do a lot of uh, fine needle aspiration as our primary diagnostic tool. About half of the cases are diagnosed with that. And then we began to, if the, when you're diagnosing these patients, you have to begin, begin to come up with some sort of treatment. Um, this is Dr. Kuya, who is a graduate of our internal medicine program and uh, has done a medical uh, oncology fellowship at Stellenbosch now and is back with us for the last about three years and she's the head of our oncology uh, program. So uh, with this, we began to develop a more comprehensive uh, cancer treatment program. And um, again, patients began to continue to come. So we're up to about 1,000 new patients per year that uh, need uh, to come with us with, with cancer problems. And so what we, uh, the idea very improbably then began to percolate that we needed to consider to do radiation therapy. So we're a hospital, like many mission hospitals, we're far in the bush. Um, we're about eight hours from the coast and the capital. Uh, there are many patients up in our area that don't have access to care, as you would understand, in most rural areas across Africa. So the demand was great, and the patients are poor. They can't afford to go to the cities and get treatment. And those were all uh, incentives for us to, uh, to develop this. Uh, we did uh, push ahead and try to develop the hospital. We got better laboratory. Um, about three years ago, we got a CT scanner, uh, which helped us a great deal. Um, and uh, we began to develop a team around uh, the idea of putting radiation therapy there. And uh, this is when uh, Professor Ngua came to visit us the first time about uh, three years ago, I think. And uh, this is the team that we had working on this. So we have all of the usual obstacles uh, that you can imagine. We didn't have personnel, uh, we didn't have money, um, other things like that. And so um, 
a team sort of spontaneously developed around this, and we now have a, we have people from uh, five different countries who are working on a project uh, to help us to to put radiation therapy there, and uh, we have advanced uh, to the level where uh, we have a donated uh, Varian 2100 um, machine. It's sitting in Wales and England uh, and in storage waiting to be uh, installed. It was given to us by the engineer that was taking care of it. He said that it was, it was, a, it was a great machine, it served well, and it deserved a better home than uh, the junkyard. And so that's how we ended up uh, with that. And we started, uh, we have a site for it. Uh, we have, actually have quite a lot of land, that isn't our problem. Uh, we're in the process of putting a hydroelectric plant there that will provide long-term stable power for, uh, for this equipment. And uh, we have a team uh, that has of in of civil engineers uh, from Canada that designed, uh, this is the design of the bunker. Um, and we are going to submit um, this uh, shielding calculation within the next couple of weeks to the IAEA office in Yaoundé. And uh, we are hoping that we will have rapid uh, approval for that. And so uh, we, uh, we, uh, our personnel issues, uh, we have one of our uh, young people that's in Germany doing a master's in medical physics right now. And we are shortly sending off uh, one of our young uh, internal medicine uh, trainees to uh, South Africa, to Stellenbosch, to do a four-year residency in medical and radiation oncology. Um, we have a commitment from part of our team that they will oversee the functioning of the machine until uh, such time as we have our own staff uh, trained. One of the major problems uh, that we all face, especially with these uh, machines that have been uh, used like this, is how do you maintain them? We have a, we have a uh, very fortunate to have a, young, uh, a guy down in the capital that is a graduate of um, um, Emory uh, University, he has a PhD in uh, biomedical technology and is interested and in, in very capable of uh, handling this, we think. So that's, uh, that is what our team consists of. And um, there are many, many challenges. The greatest challenge we face right now is that we're, if you follow what's going on in Cameroon these days, there is a crisis between the Anglophone area and the Francophone, and we're in the Anglophone side. So. Uh, that's causing us quite a lot of uh, problems, and we hope that that gets settled uh, so that we can move ahead with it. But uh, we think that we have most of the obstacles uh, at least addressed, and uh, it will be a challenge, but uh, we hope that we can succeed. It's very important uh, to the care of many, many patients that uh, are presenting to us with these very difficult uh, medical problems right now. Thank you. So I'll be presenting, uh, I'll be calling on Jennifer Dent, the president of BioVentures for Global Health. BioVentures for Global Health is a nonprofit organization based in Seattle that works with private sector and government to make drugs and technologies accessible in African countries. Jennifer. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to, great to be back here again this year. And Will, Ahmed, thank you very much for the invitation and for organizing this fantastic um, conference. So Kingsley's just told you who we are, so I won't spend any time on that. Um, but just to uh, kind of brief you and bring you up to speed on BBJH's African Access Initiative program. So I spoke about this program one year ago and we'll give you a little bit of a refresh, but also most importantly, tell you what's happened over the last year uh, with, our, with our program. So the African Access Initiative was, uh, it's a program that we launched in June of 2017, so almost two years ago now, 
with really four goals in mind. Um, one, to provide um, sustainable, affordable, uh, quality access to African prioritized cancer medicines and technologies, um, to build oncology, healthcare professional, and, and researcher capacity so they could safely deliver those cancer medicines to patients, and also to strengthen laboratory capacity so that patients could be diagnosed correctly to receive the, the proper treatment. Um, after we launched AAI, we um, decided that uh, developing a, a, a component of the program that focused on creating uh, clinical trials that were driven by the priorities of African oncologists would be appropriate. So we launched the, um, the African Consortium for Cancer Clinical Trials in November of, of 2017 at the Aortic International Conference. So our partners um, on the African Access Initiative include pharmaceutical companies. We're working formally with um, Takeda Pharmaceuticals as well as Pfizer. And through our request for proposals process, we're also engaging with a number of, of other leading oncology pharmaceutical companies. We're also working with Aortic, and we've signed MOUs with um, just with six African ministries of health. So we're working in, in six countries uh, currently. So the, the way that we've introduced this program is we first start at the Ministry of Health level. So we're only working in countries where the Minister of Health has established a national cancer strategy or plan and is prioritizing improving cancer patient outcomes in the country. And so in, in, this, in this photo, this was last April where the Nigerian Minister of Health launched Nigeria's National uh, Cancer Control Plan. And we started with the, the National Cancer Control Plan and then moved to the hospitals in, in each of our countries. So once we have an agreement in place with the, with the Ministry of Health and we understand what they're prioritizing through their national plan, we then identify hospitals in the country that are currently managing and treating cancer patients. And we work with those hospitals to implement a needs assessment or a questionnaire that is a, a comprehensive assessment that looks at uh, how cancer patients are presenting at the hospital, so how many patients present with each type of cancer, at what stage of, of the disease are, are cancer patients presenting, and then it follows the cancer patient across the entire treatment pathway to understand what resources and infrastructure and human skills um, currently exist in the hospital. And we also have about almost eight pages now of a questionnaire that lists FDA-approved cancer medicines, and we ask if you have access to it, if it's high quality, if it's affordable, if it's sustainable, how the hospital procures the medicine, and if it's a priority for that hospital to gain, to gain access to the medicine. And all of our programs through the African Access Initiative are, are developed around the hospital needs assessment and the National Cancer Control Plan because sustainability and, and developing programs that are truly addressing what are the priorities of our, of our partners in Africa is kind of central to our approach. And so since I was here last year, we have started to um, implement and execute programs around the priorities that are coming out of those needs assessments, including um, our goal of driving access to prioritized cancer medicines in, in Nigeria, we've been working closely with the, the Honorable Minister of Health, Professor Adewale, and his team to, to bring together the hospital teams. Um, we actually held a meeting, a cancer stakeholder meeting at the end of September of last year to bring together the oncology, oncology teams from the eight federally funded um, cancer centers of excellence in the country to decide on it, common treatment guidelines and regimens that they would use for the five cancers that were being prioritized by the government. So we came away from that meeting with a list of 26 cancer medicines for five cancers that uh, were prioritized. Our team then worked with the Ministry of Health team to develop a request for proposals 
specifically um, requesting those 26 cancer medicines from the 11 companies that manufacture those, those drugs. And we issued that request for proposals to companies. We received responses. And we then developed budgets for each of the hospitals and, and also for the, the, the entire country on, on their, what it would cost to actually treat the patients um, that presented at the 19 hospitals that we were working with. Um, as many of you will know, Nigeria had an election, a presidential election this year. So uh, we then were guided to take the access program to the state level. We've been working in three states um, to drive the access program at that state level. And we've built business plans around the state and funding plans um, at the state level with the governors, commissioners for health, and some other key stakeholders. And so right now, we're um, actually we're actually quite close in, in three of our states in actually putting the agreements in place for the access. So we hope to have drugs um, to patients um, within the next three months. We've also been working to build capacity and fill the gaps that have been identified, again, through the, through the needs assessment. And that includes a number of, of training programs and workshops. As Ahmed said, partnerships are key. And all of, our, all of our educational and workshops and training programs have been conducted in partnership with, with different groups. Um, we've coordinated hematology and breast cancer um, surgical training. We've also held um, pathology training workshops in, in Nigeria. Um, most recently, just last month, we held a, a program on breast cancer diagnosis in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. We had 95 um, physicians from 10 Francophone countries that participated in that program. And over the next six months, we have um, additional programs that are confirmed in training, including a, a cancer patient referral uh, program together with the Ministry of Health of, of Rwanda. We are holding a radiation therapy workshop that is in partnership with Friends of Cancer patients. Um, we also are, are, will be holding a multidisciplinary prostate cancer management program that's in partnership with, with ASCO. So those are some of the programs that are confirmed and we have dates and venues um, scheduled for those. And we have some other programs that are still in the works. But if anyone is interested in, in participating or contributing, um, please feel free to speak to me because we, these programs are not exclusive to specific countries or specific groups. Anyone is welcome to, to participate. And there's no cost for, for anyone to, to participate. We've also worked, um, done quite a bit of work in building uh, pathology and diagnostic capacity. Um, we've, that's included placing some laboratory equipment at the Federal Medical Center in, in Ondo State. We've coordinated fellowships and training um, on developing laboratory SOPs in Kigali, Rwanda. Um, we've also continued to work um, in Rwanda with the Ministry of Health team on building diagnostic capacity and operationalizing um, equipment that had already been in, in a couple of the hospitals, but also fixing equipment, bringing in technicians to fix equipment that um, was missing parts or needed to be operationalized. And we've supported the Rwandan um, teams in, in improving their SLIPTA score. And they've actually moved from two to four out of five on their, on their accreditation score since we've started that program. And we have some ongoing programs uh, in pathology uh, capacity building in Rwanda. So we are, we're also working um, with the Ministry of Health on a, a cancer tissue transport uh, program development. Um, we have a fellowship scheduled in, uh, in Kenya on a patient sample referral system. And we have um, fellowships um, in, is scheduled for Cote d'Ivoire and Rwanda in developing and implementing SOPs in, in the pathology lab. 
Um, we've also worked to build clinical trial capacity. As I said, we launched AC3T at Aortic last year. We placed fellows. They were from Merck, MSD, um, in Kenya to train on, on clinical trial management. And we've designed and built an online platform that will showcase um, the readiness of sites in Africa to conduct cancer clinical trials. And that's a program that we'll be launching and, and making live um, later this year. And I think, importantly, advocacy and, and, and um, awareness are, are a critical component to, raise, to bringing patients in early, earlier and raising awareness of the problem and the needs of cancer in Africa. Um, I presented our African Access Initiative model at the Biden Cancer Summit in, in September of last year, and we're continuing to work with BCI and also with the, the Biden separately now. Um, and we've also partnered with the Ministry of Health and um, Dr. Diane Gashamba's team on some cervical cancer screen and treat programs that we're hoping to roll out over, over the next few months in Rwanda. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Susanna, the head of Kosovo National Board for Cancer Control. Honored moderators, panelists, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like uh, to express my great appreciation to organizers of the Global Health uh, Catalyst Summit for giving me this opportunity to speak among uh, powerful speakers from all over the world and in uh, such outstanding center as uh, uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, cancer is a big calamity of the centuries. It is a leading cause of death globally, and it is predicted and projected to continue rising as life expectancy increases. Although patient survival rates for some types of cancer are high due to clinical advances in treatment protocols, the search for effective treatment remains an ultimate goal in oncology. However, there is a hope, there is a promise, thanking to many scientists, especially to Jim Allison, who was awarded a Nobel Prize for breakthrough cancer treatment. Now immunotherapy is taking its place alongside other therapeutic uh, options as a prime weapon against cancer. Like uh, Yogi Berra said, the future ain't what it used to be. Uh, in term, according to Global Can 2018, in terms of global cancer incidence, there are 18.1 million new cancer cases worldwide. And in terms of global cancer mortality, there are 9.6 million uh, cancer deaths. Uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer has uh, published uh, the most uh, frequent types of cancer uh, in 2018, and in terms of incidence and mortality, lung cancer remains number one, and there are differences in terms of uh, different types of uh, cancer. And uh, there is a difference uh, uh, between uh, uh, EU and non-EU Mediterranean countries in terms of uh, incidence and mortality rates among different types of uh, cancer. Now let me present some uh, information regarding Kosovo National Board for Cancer Control. Our mission is to decrease cancer mortality rate in Kosovo by providing guidance, support, and funding for effective national cancer control program. 
and our vision is to reduce the cancer burden, promoting outstanding cancer prevention in order to decrease the cancer incidence and in particular advanced disease, early detection uh, of cancer, state of art uh, for treatment of uh, cancer patients, improve quality of life and restore hope. Uh, we have prepared Kosovo National Program for Cancer Control for the period of 2014 to 2020. And our main strategic objectives are organized in four pillars, like cancer registry activities, cancer prevention, screening and early detection, as well as cancer treatment, including palliative care. And um, according to, actually, a U Union for International Cancer Control, as a global cancer control uh, set uh, nine targets uh, in the World Cancer Declaration that are supposed to be achieved by 2025. And Kosovo has made some progress against World Cancer Declaration targets. Uh, we have improved cancer control nationally uh, in terms of the surveillance system, like reporting on cancer and registering data, uh, policy commitment in tobacco control. Uh, we have prepared screening program for cervical, breast, and colorectal cancer that should be uh, also uh, sustained. Uh, and uh, uh, stigma, myths, and misconception associated with cancer are reduced in Kosovo. But effective pain control and distress, stress, distress management services should be improved in Kosovo. And the last but not the least, accurate cancer diagnosis, quality multimodal treatment, rehabil rehabilitation, supportive and palliative care services, uh, availability of affordable essential medicine and technologies should be improved in Kosovo. Our priority uh, of our national program is effective uh, cancer registry. We should have uh, effective and reliable uh, and informational uh, cancer registry. And uh, in this uh, regard, we have organized different, uh, we have established cancer registry and we have organized different activities uh, with the staff uh, involved in uh, reporting on cancer uh, and um, uh, let me present some Kosovo data on cancer according to our National Cancer Registry. And we have uh, presented, uh, you see, the prevalence and the incidence of the cancer in general for the period of 2016 to 2018. And there is, uh, it is obvious uh, increasing rates of uh, uh, cancer for two years, and the last year there is a slight uh, decrease. And uh, most frequent groups of malignant diseases, out of total number of malignant diseases during the mentioned years, are malignant diseases of breast, GI tract, and respiratory system. And we have presented uh, uh, according uh, data according to ICD-10 uh, codes. And the most frequent uh, new cancer cases in Kosovo are breast, lung, urinary bladder cancer, prostate, and colorectal cancer. And according to our statistical agency of Kosovo, the, in terms of cancer mortality rate, the most frequent cause of death from cancer is from lung, uh, breast, prostate, colorectal, and urinary bladder cancer. Uh, in this picture, I presented uh, the, the picture uh, of Peter Paul, Paul Rubens, uh, Hercules killing the dragon. And I see our fight against cancer and our search for a cure that could eventually be a Rosetta Stone in oncology. Our oncology clinic in Kosovo is established in 2010. There are 19 oncologists working, one psychologist, one physiotherapist, 35 nurses, five physicists, two pharmacists, and two pharmacy technicians. And there is a department of chemo and radiotherapy for uh, 24 hours uh, service, uh, outpatient service, pharmacy, and laboratory. And in oncology clinic in 2018, there were 1,500 new cancer cases. They performed many cytostatic and uh, preparations, as well as uh, many curative and palliative radiations. Unfortunately, in Kosovo, there is not palliative care uh, unit as a separate unit. In terms of prevention, as I said before, we have prepared national screening programs for cervical, breast, and colorectal cancer. Cervical and breast cancer screening program are ongoing, uh, while colorectal cancer screening program is foreseen for this year. 
uh, we uh, consulted uh, many uh, studies uh, regarding national cancer screening programs. For uh, uh, national breast cancer screening program was organized as a mobile <coughs> mammography project, and it started uh, uh, in 2014 as a MAMO-1 uh, project, and then with MAMO-2 in 2016. So there were um, involved approximately 2% of all women aged above 40 years old. This project revealed 44 new cases of breast cancer, that means 1.1%. Uh, and um, the goal of the project MAMO 1 and 2 was to encourage women uh, to, for mammographic examination to offer quality mammographic examinations in regions uh, not covered with mammographic services to, uh, to raise awareness for breast cancer. So we implemented in more than uh, 350 uh, villages and there were included uh, involved uh, uh, vulnerable group of population. And the National Cervical Cancer Screening Program started last year, and uh, we involved uh, over 2,000 uh, women uh, screening for pa uh, pap test. Uh, and the most frequent uh, age group uh, uh, involved was the age group of 40 to 49, and the least group uh, was uh, uh, under 30 years uh, old. And we have uh, evaluated them according to Bethesda system, and in 10%, uh, there were abnormal cells. Epithelial cell abnormal Normality were like squamous cell, ASCOS, ESC age, and low gray cell. High gray cell and squamous cell carcinoma were not uh, uh, found. And in terms of continuing medical education and continuing professional development as a priorities uh, of uh, as priorities of our national. Uh, program for cancer control, we organize different educational uh, activities, uh, uh, mainly uh, in, in different settings, uh, uh, in mainly as uh, roundtables with uh, interdisciplinary panel discussion uh, format. And our priority is enhancement of national and international cancer control. Uh, being a member of Union for International Cancer Control, as well as the Mediterranean Task Force for Cancer Control, we share our challenges in implementing our national uh, program and uh, we undertook together uh, different uh, uh, activities uh, to increase public understanding on cancer with impact in our citizens. And we have prepared the uh, leaflets uh, uh, on diet and nutrition as well as uh, leaflets uh, for uh, risk factors of most common types of uh, cancer. Uh, there was a uh, uh, prepare, performed uh, palliative care in Kosovo project uh, uh, by Dartmouth and Kosovo student, and this was based uh, uh, on our long-term uh, collaboration with uh, Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, and Norris Cotton Cancer Center. And being a member of MTCC, we initially prepared the uh, leaflets in English, then uh, the, the the purpose was uh, to translate uh, in, in uh, all languages of all countries involved in Mediterranean uh, Task Force for Cancer Control, and in this uh, uh, regard, we have uh, translated them in Albanian as well. So it's uh, for nutrition and uh, cancer. And we are part of different campaigns, uh, world campaigns for uh, World Cancer Day, HPV Day, and uh, during uh, these activities, we uh, disseminate and distribute uh, leaflets for, for our citizens. Uh, another project that we have uh, implemented is the role of art in healing cancer patients. And um, the philosophy of this idea was creating art, no skills required, knowing that it has a central role in healing cancer patients and um, and uh, uh, knowing that, uh, given that uh, the uh, emotional well-being uh, uh, has a great impact in, impact in overall uh, health condition of the patient. So in this uh, uh, project, we involved the breast cancer survivors as well as the children who uh, survived uh, from cancer. And this uh, project was initiated in collaboration with Kosova artists, painters. And at the end uh, of the activity, our famous painter will ex uh, will explain the most powerful messages and emotions pres presented uh, through uh, painting by uh, children and by uh, uh, breast cancer survivors. And uh, we are uh, a part of international activities for global cancer control. Uh, we have organized and coordinated a session during the World Cancer Congress and uh, uh, World Cancer. Uh, we were part of World Cancer Leader Summit as well as part of General Assembly of the 
UICC, also part of the different uh, uh, activities organized by European Center for Parliamentary uh, Study. So Kosovo is a part of MTCC and, MTC and uh, UICC. And the question is, what do we have to do to combat cancer? The answer uh, from our standpoint of view is act across the countries, collaboration with NGOs and advocacy groups, fundraising, it is said, whoever has the gold makes the rules, raise public awareness, educate people who work in the field, make a plan, because a long journey starts with a simple step, understand the importance of the problem, because knowledge is the power, and at the end, better to fight for something than live for nothing. So, thank you for your time. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Golam Abu Zakaria. He's the chairman and chief medical physicist of Klinkum Oldenburg Teaching Hospital in Cologne, Germany. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think it is good evening, better because it's too late, but I find uh, this is a very good uh, stage where everybody can share their experiences and learn from others. That's why I'm very happy to be here, Ahmed, and you and uh, Wilfried give me the chance to work with you in this global health catalyst. Uh, I have given here my name with the three institute. Uh, this is a... Uh, just, uh, actually, I have prepared this lectures for 15 minutes, but I know it is only 10 minutes, so I prepared and modified my lectures, but it, that, it did not function. So I have my old lectures, so I will sweep some slides. It is not, it is boring, but I should do it. I'm just fighting five minutes to 10 minutes to put the new one, it's not functioning. I do not know why. Yes, we have done everything. So actually I give here uh, three institute, one is actually for the future, the South Asian Institute of Medical Physics and Cancer Research. You know, it's South Asian, <laughs> the whole subcontinent, and the older British Indian. Uh, and this is the place where I work, this second one. And actually, it is a hospital. I had the capacity, I had the uh, um, support of my whole hospital to do something for the developing country. So I'm happy to do something. And the last one, actually the department we have established in Bangladesh with the help of German community and many of my German friends and German, German governments. I will share you my uh, story. I hope I will finish it uh, earlier. So this is actually uh, a very uh, a, a important uh, question here. The total cancer dates in the industrial country and the developing country, you see the developing country, the numbers of uh, cancer death is increasing. In every 10 years, it is 25%. Um, so I do not hope that it is increasing and increasing. We will stop this uh, trends. Second, it is, you know, the Indian continent, it is actually not only geographical, it is also political now. It is eight countries. It started from India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, and Maladivan. And this is a country, this is a huge uh, um, a continent. One fourth of the whole population of the world population living in this place. And 40% of Asian population in this place. You see a huge number of people 
with poverty, all the problems in the world is there. But, but we have also huge potential. You see, this is an old uh, cultural place and have a tradition also in physics. And the older time, for 1,000 years, they have done physics. So I give some here example. When you visit India, in Jaipur, you can find uh, many, many physical uh, instances. So I will put it also because it is a very problematic. But you see here also great people is born. These are all physicists. Most of the physicists known. The, uh, the Bosch is the right, right side. He is actually Bosch Einstein statistic. He invented in Bangladesh these statistics. You know the uh, left one, the Chandrasekhar Raman. He is the first Asian won the Nobel Prize in physics. And the, here is the Abdus Salam. He is the founder of ICTP in Trieste. And ICTP has a very, very good program. I asked all the medical physics world, please apply for there, and you can come, and IAEA support you, and you can have two years master course, and you can jo enjoy there and help your country. So these all people are born also in this region. So it is actually most cancer is in all, the, all over the world. Uh, maybe five, six to eight cancers, they are covered 80%. So it is clear we have less number of cancer types, and we can have an infrastructure, develop the infrastructure and do that. It's possible. And here I have given another challenge. You see, it is from ICON. Uh, there's a number of, uh, you see in my first thing, fourth place, it is 613 linear accelerator. That means the high voltage machine in this region. And in 15 years, it should be uh, it should be 2,900. That means we have time 15 years to five times the number of uh, megavolts. It's a huge challenge, but we should help our people, and the people is waiting for their uh, cure. So this is actually what I am in Germany a long time. I have studied there, and uh, I have a feeling for my countries, and of course in the developing countries. So in the German Society of Medical Physics, we suggested, I'm one of the people that suggested, please, why we should not look before our dishes? We have a dish, here is our foods. Why you cannot see the dishes? I don't know the English is strict. German is strict like this. So we, we actually suggested to build a working group. It is called Medical Physics in the Developing Countries. When we selected three countries, one is Bangladesh, one is Tanzania, and another is Nicaragua. So because why we have selected this one? Because some people are interested for these countries. Of course, I am interested also for Bangladesh because I'm coming from. You see here, I was also in Tanzania, and there is another group, another story. And I want to say my story in Bangladesh. So actually, this is where I started after the, after the uh, uh, just a moment. Here, we have selected what we are doing. We do seminar in the developing countries. We motivated the professors and retired person come here and do that. And we bring the student maybe in, the, in Germany, so it is started. And we collect machines and send these people uh, there. So these are the, uh, these are the uh, things we are uh, started to doing. And this is the first, uh, we have, you have a very good promoter. In this country, you, you should have uh, access to the both cultures. And so it's possible then you can uh, uh, create something. Here I see that at the times it is the first we started in 1996, and here this, this working group is 1993. So after three years, we started in Bangladesh. You see here is my colleagues, they are professors, and the red, red side, he's a professor of Dhaka uh, University in Bangladesh, he's a very good friend of me, and so we started this story. And we have seminar 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000. So many seminars with 100 participants. They are doctors and, of course, the physicists. At the time, there is no medical physicist in Bangladesh. Some people are working in the, uh, in the medicine, but they're called uh, scientific officers. But the term medical physics is unknown. So we have started. When you see that there is a, uh, there is a here, uh, and the participant told us why you are only seminar and uh, exercise. You should go a subject, medical physics. Then I said it's very heavy challenge. How can you do the medical physics? So we, we, this is 
the university, the private university, we have checked many universities, but this university has told us it's possible to uh, have a subject. And so we started, and uh, uh, the university is actually uh, founded in 1998. This is the very new university. We started medical physics 2000, only two years later. So I asked, uh, I come to Germany and asked the different professors and my colleagues, should we do that? And they say, yes, we take the challenge when you are with us and you know the cultures. So we started, uh, started the medical physics department in Bangladesh. And it is our luck, the German government gives us three, uh, four years uh, scholarship for the student and everything. So we can start at a very good things. When you see, these are the, uh, this is the left one, the professor Joseph Bille, he's my PhD supervisor. Yeah, I, I was very good contact to him, and he told me, yes, we do that. And all the professors here, Schlegel, Hartmann, and we started. And it was actually, at that time, Bangladesh, no linear uh, accelerator. So, we started the first student, they come, only the practical part in Germany, they come back and do their master thesis. So we have started this one, and you see, this is all the outcome. We, we could uh, bring 13, uh, okay, 20 people here, and they trained in medical physics. And so they back, and they are the pioneers of medical physics in Bangladesh. Yeah, when you see, this is that, I will go very quick. And now, uh, it is, uh, uh, 2000, uh, 2003 to 2006, four years, we have built the pioneers people. They're working in Bangladesh. When we have done uh, uh, six to 12, six to 12, we are free. We want to see whether this department can exist, can be sustainable or not. We see, yes, they can working, they're fighting. So we again approach the German government. We should need, again, four years scholarship and everything. So we could, with the help of my friends is here, we could have 40, 40 people can in Germany. Yeah? Some are trained in their teachers, some are trained in senior thesis so that they can monitor the thesis of our student. So we have bring the 40 students, we have done this. This is the picture you see here uh, from Mannheim in Heidelberg University. And the, this is the existing international conference. We extend our cooperation uh, in India and in China, and of course in Germany. You see in different, very, very, uh, 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 photos and you see the activities and then get uh, then had we have you see in in between 2018 we have 90 bachelor and 33 uh, master student is produced in this department and you see now uh, we have a very good start we asked again the German government should we have another four year scholarship we want to extend our cooperation in South Asia, not only in Bangladesh. So we started 2017, because except India, other South Asian countries is the same condition, Nepal, Bhutan, even Afghanistan, no radiotherapy, Maladivin is not therapy. So we want to train again 40 people in the South Asian region, and we have started in last, last year, it came from Nepal, from Bhutan and everything, this year come from India, and even from Pakistan is our participant. And here actually, uh, the, uh, the next one, so the co question is how can we do that? We cannot do uh, uh, everything together. So we ask the government again, should we should uh, build an institute. And this institute is called South Asian Center for Medical Physics and Research. You see many, many tags we have given. It is a holistic approach. We do everything, but main thing, we actually do the trend of medical physics. We have started. Tomorrow, we have a lectures by Rashid. He's one of the uh, person from South Asia. He explained everything what this, uh, this center is done in, so in between. I do not explain everything now. I have little time. And here you see in this SCMPR, the South Asian Center for Medical Physics and Cancer Research, we have national and international partners. So we have everything holistic ap approach, but not the hospital. So we need the hospital in national and international. So in, this year we go to Nepal, and in Nepal hospital we do our uh, uh, hands-on training. So you see here, uh, the Rashid will tell you tomorrow. I can give you only one seminar. It was uh, in, in Dhaka, in the uh, campus of uh, SCMPR. You see, this is a dosimetry and treatment planning. What is important for us, these are all participants from South Asian region, 
from every country. Here I have written Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. There are 70, 37 participants. And what we have done, we should do a very, very uh, high quality. That means the teachers come from university, and the hands-on training is the industrial partner. In this case, they are PTW. So we ask the people, they're very nice. They told, yes, you collected eight countries, so we do not pay for the people. So we come for our cost and train the people. So the trained in hospital in all the countries is a very high quality training. It is three days training in hands-on training. So what is for me is very important. In Mannheim, in Heidelberg University, there is a conference from the Global Health Catalyst. When you see this is the conference, I was there, and I learned this, uh, the health minister, uh, Dr. Dr. Gasomba, and she actually in just in the in the interval comes to uh, come to me because one of my friends here style give a lectures about our project, and she come to me at guess like oh this is very fantastic what can you do for my country? Then I say oh this is very emotional moment for me. I so I will give two scholarship for you, just without asking the university. I gave her two scholarship, and after that, I telephoned the university. I have given two scholarship student for Rwanda. is a very model country in Africa. I was there, and uh, they said, okay, we do this, because it's not too expensive, so we can offer two scholarship. Here, the two student name, they're coming to in, in, in our department in Dhaka uh, to, uh, in, in July, when they study master thesis, maybe the first medical physics in Rwanda. And uh, here you have picture, you know everybody here. So what is important, of course here not only the, this is this, the people are not here uh, uh, coming for the two scholarship, they have other deals are doing with the Heidelberg University, but I have given my here. And you see here, I am very much fascinated for, for this uh, country. I was in, then, uh, in, in uh, Luanda, Rwanda or in uh, Kigali. It's a fantastic country. May I, may I allow to say maybe German is very clean and everything. I think Rwanda is more cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is nothing I have seen because I came from Indian, Indian continent. Everywhere something is there. Yeah. <laughs> but in but but in Rwanda it's a fantastic. Yeah. Nothing nothing in the street. I was so much impressed this country. I love this country. And here you see the Ahmed and everybody. We have very enjoyed. The people are very fantastic. And this, and what is important here, and uh, we have done this conference there. So on, uh, what we have planned, because the two students, but we cannot. So we have a plan with everybody. That's, there is, a, there is a, um, a cooperation between South Asia and Africa. So we planned. So we have applied for the German government. Can we take 10 African students come to either in Germany or Bangladesh to study medical physics? But we applied. They did not accept till now. And they have given our hope next year. Maybe we can bring 10 African students in this department. or in, uh, in um, And here, the Global Health can help their learning program. I hope there should be very good cooperation in South Asia region and the African, East Africa region. I hope very much it's possible. So this is my last slide, and we'll read it with you. To give corn to a needy person will make him die of hunger, but teach him how to plant, and he can feed his entire family. This is an African proverb. Thank you very much. So just a short announcement, please, for everyone. So uh, uh, until we finish uh, the rest of the talks here, the, the other session will not start. But we have to be really fast to finish the talks. So otherwise, the food is still not served. But at some point, we will start the service. So please uh, be aware that we will start the session there after we finish this session. Another uh, issue is for those that have uh, used the, the parking slots here at the Yafki Center, 
when you come out, please show this badge so you don't have to pay. Yeah? Thanks. That was the video. Video. Uh, now I have the pleasure to present the video of Dr. Alves and his team of Mercurius Health. This is uh, an also an, another model, another example that is in Mozambique and Angola. They have some uh, uh, accelerator where they said that they are not functioning. And this group of uh, companies, Portuguese, and uh, uh, went there with their team and they uh, as they uh, explained to us that they would be uh, uh, they would be happy to finish quickly that is to say their mission is for four years and but will be happy if it's finished well after three years or two years and now you will see that uh, the service in Mozambique is functioning and is working train people and this is another example, there is no excuse to leave machines which say there is no, no personnel waiting for training, but you can move. And this is uh, an example. And this is an another example of a partnership with whatever. This is Mercurius is private, is a company, is making uh, money for, from this. But this is, we encourage this really to, to see things, to see the wheel turns. This is very important. And you will see this uh, 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 fascinating example of a, a, um, a, a service in Mozambique functioning. This is very important. In 2014, we started a project in Mozambique to make radiotherapy and cancer treatment available to those in need for the people, by the people, to increase quality of life. We install all the equipment, provide training, follow the project development from start to finish with an experienced team that works on location and remotely. We assure everything works properly in total safety. We do it in partnership with local communities and institutions. With respect for local culture, seeking the greater good together. Componente dos enfermeiros e a componente médica são pessoas jovens, bastante motivadas e devidamente treinadas. Acredito que esse serviço fará toda a diferença para o país. For better health in Africa and everywhere. Um dos meus esforços é quando os obstáculos diminuem. É verdade que necessitamos criar ajustes, investindo um tempo em conhecer as pessoas. É preciso ser gente de confiança e com capacidade de instalar confiança para o outro lado. Só assim podemos caminhar juntos. Mercurius Health. Obsession for life. Mercurius Health and, and Professor Francisco Alves are partners in Harvard Global Health Catalyst. And so if you have services not functioning, they can go to, to make it function and train people and leave the country after with the personnel, local personnel who will do the job. And this is the objective. After, I have the pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, Sumera Bhatt, Shaukat Khanum Memorial Hospital. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Sumera Bhatt, and I'm a radiation oncologist working at Shaukat Khanum in Pakistan. Uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, talk in front of this August audience, and I would like to uh, represent Shaukat Khanum in front of you. So, how do I go? Sorry. 
So I'm going to represent that uh, how Shaukat Khanam is transforming cancer care in Pakistan. Uh, just to give you an overview, Pakistan is the fifth most populous country in the world, and despite having a population of 220 million, the GDP per capita and income per capita remains very low. And as you can see from this graph, that Pakistan falls very uh, low as compared to the other developing countries as well as far as public health expenditure is concerned. This is the reason why most of the spending in Pakistan is out of own pocket and the insurance and the government is contributing very small to the health system. The annual incidence of Pakistan is estimated to be 173,000 patients uh, per year. This is an estimated uh, value because we don't have formal cancer national registry. And there are only 30 hospitals in Pakistan who, are, who have actually major oncology services. There are more than 50 general hospitals, but they have minor oncology facilities. So not only the quantity, but quality is also lacking. So how Shaukat Khanam is acting as a model institution and how it was inspirated, this is a picture of a former cricketer and current Prime Minister of Pakistan with his mother, Shaukat Khanam. She was the inspiration behind building a hospital, cancer hospital, Shaukat Khanam, in which cancer treatment is easily accessible to all the citizens of Pakistan, irrespective of their background. So this is clearly apparent from our mission statements. Shaukat Khanam is a model institute, and we are acting to relieve the suffering of cancer through state-of-the-art technology, irrespective of their ability to pay. This is very important. And we are also promoting education and research into this cause. This dream has been fulfilled by the relentless efforts of the SKM team, which is working towards this cause. And this has been made possible because of their efforts. Shaukat Khana building was started in 1990, and it was completed in 1994, and with a total cost of $22 million. Our core values are that every patient should get equal treatment. And as you can see, you can have a private patient and a supported patient in the same room using the same hospital and clinical facilities. And 75% of our patients are treated for free, and only 25% of the patients are paying for their treatment. Shaukat Khanam currently employs 3,000 uh, uh, staff, and which includes consultants, trainees, physicians, nursing staff, allied and support staff, uh, support, uh, staff as well. We have got all the clinical and supportive services under one roof. As you can see, we have got all the departments, medical oncology, pediatric oncology, radiation oncology, as well as palliative care and all the other facilities along with supportive staff. The supportive staff is very important for the smooth running of the hospital. The hospital cannot run properly, smoothly, if we don't have support from all these departments. We have a home-built hospital information system, and this hospital information system is integrated for financial, administrative, and clinical domains. And this, actually, hospital system is working successfully at Shaukat Khanam and many other hospitals in Pakistan. And this system has also been given free of any cost to the other government hospitals in Pakistan now to improve the quality of care in the hospitals. And we are recently uh, under process of developing a mobile app for the patients and for the health professionals. So Shaukat Khanam employs heavily in state-of-the-art equipment. And we have got uh, many radiological uh, machines, including three Tesla MRIs, 160 CT scanners. And then the first PET CT scanners was, in was installed at Shaukat Khanam in 2008. And the second one was installed in Karachi in 2012. And Shaukat Khanam has got the biggest radiotherapy facility in Pakistan, including four linear accelerators in Lahore. And recently, we have installed two linear accelerators, which were donated. Other projects of Shaukat Khanam are, it's, we have got two fully functional hospitals, one in Lahore, one in Karachi, uh, one in Lahore, one in Peshawar, and we have got uh, diagnostic centers, we have got walk-in centers. These walk-in centers are actually screening the cancer, cancer patients so that they can be registered in the hospital, and we have got a network of laboratory collection centers which actually generates revenue for the hospital as well. This is the current activity at Shaukat Khanam. As you can see, in 2019, the 
Clinical activity is exponentially increasing uh, every year, and you can see that almost 10,000 new registration uh, were done in uh, last year, with around 13,000 admissions, 64,000 radiotherapy treatments, and 46,000, around 47,000 chemotherapy sessions. This is clearly evident that, you know, it's a busy hospital. And to meet these demands, we need uh, workforce, we need manpower, and Shaukat Khanam needs, we need resources to run all these facilities as well. The main income of the hospital is coming from zakat, uh, donations, and hospital services. So hospital services are contributing almost 50% of the hospital revenue. Zakat, which is a religious charity and donation, is contributing to the rest of the functioning of the hospital. And as you can see, the, all three are going, uh, increasing with time, and this is a proof that people have trust in Shaukat Khanam, and they continue to donate money for this cause. So far, we have spent $420 million in philanthropic treatment, and this is the reason why we are getting donations not only from Pakistan, but all over the world. And we have this, we have received almost 70% domestic donations and 30% overseas donations as well. And we have got registered charity, registered charity all, across, uh, the, all across the world. So uh, talking about research at Chokat Khanam, we have a well-defined research guidelines, and we have got a research approval processes, including scientific and ethical review boards. We have GCP-compliant standard operating procedures. We have got over 250 peer-reviewed uh, publications. We have national and international collaborations. We have um, phase, many phase two and three trials running, currently running over at, at, in the, at the hospital. And we have got qualified research staff and a fully equipped uh, basic science lab. And as you can see, our research framework comprises of three main domains, the clinical research, cancer registry, and basic sciences. Recently, we have also uh, introduced tumor bank which includes a uh, tumor bank for the breast and colorectal uh, cancer so far. And it is also involved in molecular and genetic research. The clinical registry has started the, uh, they has taken the initiative of uh, making their own registry, which is known as Punjab Cancer Registry. And it is collecting data about cancer incidents in the Punjab area. And it is also involved in outcome research. Uh, which is collected locally in the hospital. Our clinical research office is involved with the institutional and um, scientific review boards, and we have clinical trials and international collaborations coming under the clinical research office. So Shaukat Khanam is not only providing clinical services, Shaukat Khanam is also facing the brain drain which the whole country is facing at the moment. And to, to meet that, for what we have done is, Shaukat Khanam has started many postgraduate training programs. These training programs are basically happening in all the facilities. And you name it, it's radiology, pathology, gastroenterology, most importantly, medical oncology, radiation oncology, and pediatric oncology. And we have got training program not only for the doctors, but also for the nursing staff, and for the paramedics, and for the technicians as well. We have recently started a senior instructorship program, which actually involves sending our junior consultants to two years to a well-renowned cancer center, either in US or UK, to get trained, and then work, then come back and work at Shaukat Khanam. This is actually helping us in getting professionals who are properly trained, and they introduce new facilities at Shaukat Khanam. Shaukat Khanam is also playing a very important part in raising the public awareness about important cancers. Breast cancer is a very important, uh, most common cancer in Pakistan. And ev in every October, this breast cancer campaign is, uh, is being run successfully by Shaukat Khanam. And many schools and universities are approached, and students are made aware of uh, the symptoms and how to treat breast cancer. And anti-tobacco campaign is also one of them. Hospital is const uh, constantly investing in improving the quality and is involved in many quality improvement projects like ISO 9001. We have certificate for certification for hazard analysis. We are also having internal and external audits. And now we are preparing for COPI and we are preparing for CAP accreditation. 
And Shaukat Khanum is one of the three hospitals in Pakistan who has been accredited, accredited by JCI International. And this is actually the golden steel of quality that hospital has been providing for the last 20 years. And Shaukat Khanum has also got many other awards like WHO Award, Human Rights Society of Pakistan, and Corporate Excellent Award as well. Because of the increasing demand of more and more cancer patients, a new cancer hospital was built in KPK in December 2015. And this has been very beneficial for the people of KPK and areas around it because they don't have to travel far away to come to Lahore to get chemotherapy treatment or get radiological treatment. And this hospital has started functioning properly in the third phase, which involves surgical uh, training the surgical procedures as well will be started next year and radiation has been started successfully this year in this hospital. The future of Shaukat Khanam is very bright and the construction of third Shaukat Khanam hospital has been started and this is going to take place in Karachi. This is the, the these three hospitals of Shaukat Khanam is a, they are a testimony that quality cancer care can be provided in a third world country if you have dedicated and honest leadership and if resources are spent in the right direction. However, I would also like to say that this is just a model uh, institute. There are many other hospitals in Pakistan that need to improve and they need to follow the same model in order to improve the healthcare system in Pakistan. Thank you so much. All right, if you look at your programs, we have two more presentations, which are video presentations, but due to time, um, we'll be moving over to the uh, Yorkie Auditorium just across the street for the next phase of the program. Thank you. Is the sun nuclear here? Sun nuclear. Sun, sun nuclear? No. Yeah. Is there anybody from Sun Nuclear here? Uh, okay. Maybe at the dinner? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right, so let's please move over to dinner. Dinner is over there at the Yaki. Everybody, please, let's go. Find the flag driver, sure. Yeah, okay. 